We now call the meeting to order. I am taking a point of privilege this evening, and I'm going to ask everybody to rise as we honor Mayor Bill Bunton, who recently passed away. Um, Mayor Bunton was a, a human being that really gave a lot to this community. He served at the state level, he served the city, and um, it was a tragic loss that we had in our community. And before we proceed with the prayer, I want to make sure that in his honor, I'm going to gavel out for Mayor Bunton his last meeting in the city council. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for the leaders that we have around here in this community, not only in the city, but in the county. Just be with us, fill us with wisdom, and just guide us so that we could continue serving this community in the way that you want us to serve, selflessly, together. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We now proceed with the roll call. Mayor De La Isla? Here. Council Members Hiller? Here. Valdivia Acla? Here. Ortiz? Emerson? Here. Padilla? Here. Nagar? Here. Dobler? Here. Duncan? And Lester? Here. We have two. Uh, I know for sure that Councilwoman Ortiz has the cold. She will not be able to make it this evening. We now move on to the appointments, if the clerk would read. It is a board appointment recommending the appointment of Dave Herbert to the Topeka Landmarks Commission for a term ending December 31, 2022. And B is a board appointment recommending the reappointment of Darcella Goodman to the Shawnee County Community Corrections Advisory Board to fill an expired term expiring March 2, 2022. You have heard the motion. Well, uh, you have heard the, the appointments. What is the pleasure of the body? We have a motion for approval by Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Emerson, and we have a second by Councilman Dobler. Comments or questions on the appointments? Seeing none, we proceed by voting. The mayor does not vote. We have seven yes. Seven having voting yes, the motion passes. Uh, can we have Mr. Frederick and Ms. Uh, Goodman, please stand up so that you could be recognized. Thank you so much for your selfless service to our community. We appreciate you being part of our boards. Thank you. We now move on to presentations. The first presentation is a Shawnee County Health Department update on coronavirus, coronavirus preparations. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, tonight, Linda Oaks from the Shawnee County Public Health is here to give us an update. And uh, if she could please come forward. Um, this is uh, something that uh, was requested by one of the governing body members, and it was perfect timing because they were planning on coming anyway. We just moved them to the front of the agenda. So thank you, Linda. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members, city staff. Thank you for inviting us here tonight. I am Linda Oaks. I'm the director of the Shawnee County Health Department. And we are here tonight to talk to you about the coronavirus, or COVID-19, as it has been named. And so I'm going to ask our Shawnee County Health Officer, Dr. John Franco Pizzino, to come up first and give you some background and talk about his role in this type of situation. Then I'll come back and give you some more information about what we are doing to prepare here in Topeka and Shawnee County. Dr. Pizzino. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm John Franco Pizzino, Shawnee County Health Officer. Um, thank you for the opportunity to give you a quick update about the preparedness activities in Shawnee County. I'm sure you are all aware of the fact that uh, starting around the end of January, uh, several cases of a new disease that then became known as coronavirus were identified in China, um, and then they spread to other countries. Uh, you probably heard the term pandemic, and some people say, well, we are already in a pandemic. Other people say, no, there's not a pandemic yet. And uh, uh, what a pandemic is, essentially, it includes three elements. It's usually a new germ that can be transmitted from person to person, cause disease, and spreads worldwide. Now, the first two are already met. We know that. People are still debating about the third one. 
uh, as far as wise, as widespread as this germ is today, some people say, well, it's still not everywhere, so it's not a pandemic. And the reason that is important is not just for academic purposes, is because the, the uh, prevention and control activities change once we move from a non-pandemic to a pandemic situation. In a non-pandemic, when you have a new virus like coronavirus, what we try to do, we try to do containment. And what that means is we try to keep the virus out of our house, home, country, continent, whatever, however you want to define it. And that's what you have seen up until very recently, uh, you know, the travel restrictions measures that were implemented at the federal level, uh, a series of other measures that really the purpose was to prevent the virus from coming into our nation. Now, the goal is really not to keep the virus out forever because from the practical point of view, we are all aware of the fact that it's probably not going to be possible. But the purpose is to slow down the arrival of the virus so that we can be better prepared. Maybe we can develop a vaccine, some treatment, and we can uh, put our preparedness plans together. Once the virus comes into our country, into our communities, then containment, of course, by definition, is no longer possible because containment means let's keep the virus out. So then we move into what we call mitigation approach. And what mitigation approach is, we try to mitigate the consequences of the virus being with us. And the way that that is done is, generally speaking, through something called social distancing, which means, essentially, we try to reduce the transmission from one person to another by keeping some distance with each other. Um, and social distancing can take multiple different forms, some of which you have probably heard already and, and uh, some of which may be new to some of us, but it can be as simple as, you know, we try to isolate the people who are sick. That's pretty intuitive, right? We do that with the flu, we do that with many other diseases. Um, but that alone is probably not going to be enough. And so we probably need to do something more that may include a social distancing that looks at community-based events and interventions. So reducing the opportunities for people to come in contact with each other and infect each other. Uh, measures such as uh, uh, reduction or, or canceling public gatherings <coughs> altogether. Um, when, uh, when you have soccer games that are canceled in Italy, you know that this is a serious situation. <laughs> and that has happened. And that is happening. In fact, I was just listening to the Italian newscast half an hour ago, and they're still canceling soccer games. So uh, um, that's one of the measures, just to give you a sense of what people do when they're talking about social distancing. Obviously, schools are big, a big concern from the public health point of view, and they're also a big concern from the educational point of view. So we do not want to disrupt the education that takes place in schools, but at the same time, that's a perfect incubator for a disease like coronavirus to spread in the community. So people look at uh, a reduction of school activities. It doesn't necessarily mean shutting down the schools altogether. It may mean reduction in classroom activities, reduction on, on the size of the classrooms, and other, you know, an emphasis maybe on uh, distant learning and things like that. Um, these are some of the things that are being contemplated by public health experts. And, uh, one of the reasons we are here today is to be sure that people know that these things are being planned. And when I say planned, what that means is we are not really planning and intending to implement it at any time that we are aware of. But should that become necessary, we are ready to take these measures. Um, from the practical point of view, the way that that would work, <coughs> under Kansas law, the authority to restrict activities such as what I have described so far falls on the county health officer and the county board of health that appoints a county health officer. So county health officer is myself, and the board of health is the three county commissioners. Um, I, through the health department, would issue a, an order, essentially, that would say, uh, you know, we close the schools for a week. I'm just making this up. I'm not saying this to scare anybody. That order is effective immediately. It does not require a vote from this council, from the County Board of Health. Uh, it does not require any kind of approval. Now, there is an appeal process that is built into the statute, and that appeal process will 
take the case in front of a court. But in the meantime, the order is in effect. So uh, I want to be clear. I'm not saying this to scare anybody. But I just also don't want anybody to be surprised should we come to that by the fact that somebody like me can actually have the power to shut the schools in our county. And believe me, it's a responsibility that I take very seriously. Those of you who know me, I've been in this position for about a decade, know that I, I have never done anything like that. Um, and and uh, if, if we come to that situation, it's because we, we, we really seriously think that that's something that we need to do to protect the health of our county. Um, so the message we have for the public is pretty simple. Number one, don't panic. It's, uh, this is not a death sentence. The vast majority of cases of this infection are going to be mild, and people will recover. In a few cases, this may be more severe and may lead to hospitalization. And unfortunately, in a few cases, people die, especially the elderly and people who have underlying conditions. But it's not a death sentence. And society is not going to stop. Um, water will still come out of your faucet. The power will still go on when you switch that switch on your, on your wall. So this is not the end of the world, OK? But it is a serious situation that we are taking very seriously. And there are things that people can do now, there are things that people can do to prepare in the future, should the situation deteriorate. What you can do now is essentially just practice good hygiene. Uh, try to cover your mouth and your nose when you sneeze and you cough. That's something we should do all the time. Wash your hands and uh, uh, stay home if you're sick. This is extremely important. This is easy to transmit by people who are sick. So we need to think also the policy level, what that means for employers who do not have uh, uh, strong policies for, you know, to allow people to stay home if they're sick. I tell you, I'm not here to make a policy statement or a political statement. From the public health point of view, that's a serious concern. If people feel compelled to go to work when they're sick, we are going to see more cases. And the other thing we are telling people is start planning. What are you going to do if your child care provider is out of commission for a week, either because he or she is sick or because the health officer says we can't allow child care settings um, to, to be open for a week or two. What are you going to do if your kids are home because schools are closed? What are you going to do if you have somebody sick in your house? Uh, where are you going to put this person? Do you have a room where this person maybe can be isolated in the house without infecting everyone else in the home? Maybe having a week or two of supplies if you have prescription medication, so you, you, you at least can uh, have those couple of weeks where you don't need to go out and go to the store and things like that. So that's the kind of level of preparedness that we are talking about. Um, but definitely, uh, we want you to know that we are working very hard to minimize the impact of this virus when it comes to our community. Um, so with that, I will give it to Linda to tell you a little bit more about the preparedness activities. Thank you, Dr. Pizzino. So Dr. Pizzino is right. We are preparing right now. So right now we have an incident action plan in place with an incident command system already in place. Um, we are working with very closely with Shawnee County Emergency Management, with City of Topeka Emergency Management to make sure we have that coordinated and collaborative response. We also have law enforcement working with us. Um, the hospitals, we had a call today with the two hospitals. Um, we will have regular calls with them. We are meeting with the superintendents later this week. We also have a meeting scheduled with our mayor and the main players who need to be at the table in a couple of weeks. So we are doing everything we can to be ready for a response. But the best thing and best advice we can give is just what Dr. Pazino said. Everyone needs to be preparing. And so this is Severe Weather Awareness Week. So it's much like that. Have your prescriptions. Have a communication plan with your family. Be ready for that kind of emergency. Or be ready to stay home for a while if, if, we, are, we, if we have to tell people you need to stay home to, to slow down the spread of the virus. We have some great infographics and checklists on our website. They're also on our Facebook page. We'll be continuing to update those as the CDC sends us updates. We're also working very closely with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment with their guidance um, 
and they have a toolkit they've given us. So there's lots of people working together, and I think that's the important message. This is a collaborative effort. It's not just the county. It's us working with all the partners that need to be at the table. So um, I, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I do want to introduce some of the other folks that are here with me today. Craig Barnes is our public information officer. So he's working very closely with your public information officer, with other public information officers in the, in the community. Esther Limon is one of our liaison officers. She is writing the, inc the um, incident action plan. She's helping us. She just comes in and reminds me things we need to do a lot. And of course, you know Jim Green, who's working with us. Dusty Nichols with our Shawnee County Emergency Management. And he's also doing a lot of guiding for us and keeping us, here's what we need to do. So there's a lot of people working together, a lot of <clears throat> meetings happening, just so we can be prepared for this um, virus. So um, unless anyone else want to add anything? I'm sorry? Sure. Yeah, and so we are in contact also with the Veterans Administration Hospital. So that would be the other big hospital here in town. So what questions do you have for any of us that are here that we can help answer? Councilwoman um, Valdivia Alcala. Thank you for this presentation. And I'm hoping that as a governing body, we'll be getting weekly updates so we don't have to bombard you guys with individual emails. I asked the city manager if that could be possible, and that would be great. And we would appreciate that, or I certainly sure. would appreciate that. I just wanted to ask a couple of things. In the information that I've been reading, some with C, uh, CDC and some of the information that you all have been handing out, and kind of just saying this out loud for the folks washing, uh, watching, hand washing is the key that they are pushing here. I mean, really, really pushing. You have to wash your hands. And I'm seeing yes. that all over Twitter. I'm seeing it trending on Twitter about washing your hands. And so I don't know if we're going to be doing anything on Channel 4, but I certainly think it'd be something proactive, this basic information, you know, to be have, uh, to have out there. Also, when it, I don't know if you've noticed, but when it comes to coughing, um, my grandchildren and most grand, most kids that are in the school system have been trained to do the coughing yes. into, you know, into the sleeve or crook of the arm, what have you. And where you see it most often when it's not done is with adults. Mm -hmm. And you see, and I can be guilty of that. I can, you know, forget to do that. But I think that things like that, to reinforce um, and have that awareness and just pushing that, you know, all the time. And I'm sure you're doing it, but I'm yes. thinking how can we do it in an accessible way for folks that may be tuning in or, or um, watching uh, Channel 4. Um, so has there, we know there's no cases in Shawnee County, but That's has correct. there been any testing for coronavirus in Shawnee County? There are no cases in Shawnee County, and right. that's all I can really say at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want to Councilwoman that? Hiller. Okay. Um, you might have more to say about this. I've been seeing it on Facebook and so on, and uh, kind of all over, it seems. But something that has struck me as the strongest um, advice is that if somebody feels like they're sick and might have the coronavirus, not to go straight to the doctor's office or the hospital or, you know, as many people have, have gotten used to doing, if, if you, you just go to minor med. Right. And, and the, the admonition to call first so that if you think you have those symptoms, they can make arrangements to get you seen without you showing up in the lobby, I thought was really important. Yeah, so the hospitals are both putting out that message, call ahead before right. you come to the ER or any of the clinics. Yeah, I haven't heard it from the minor meds and so on, but I would assume they want the same. Yes, call ahead. <clears throat> There's still a lot of respiratory viruses going around right there now. There are. I will add that. So. Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. Um, another thing that I've been reading quite a bit and consistently, and just to verify, the rates appear lower in children. <laughs> Is that correct? Different from all the other flus and viruses that are out there that seem to be hitting kids hard. But this virus is 
is that is correct right now mm -hmm. that is what we're seeing keeping in mind that things can change but right now we're not seeing it as serious in children i think the elderly with underlying health conditions are really the hardest hit group okay and i'm going to make a comment in that you know it's it's unfortunate that that these type of illnesses spring up uh, with the immediacy that they do and, and with media feeding into a lot of the fear. Some of it, I think, is proactive in nature, but I think that it, it's really a commentary when we know folks with the flu, folks with all kinds of viruses, and if it ends up here, which, of course, we hope it don't, it does not, they will be going to work. And I mean, I know you guys can't make that statement, but I'm going to make that statement really, uh, and it's unfortunate because either they, you know, they may, their job may be in jeopardy, they don't have the sick leave, they don't have the benefits or whatever. And uh, I think that businesses, small, medium, and large alike, you know, I would hope that they're, they're really taking a hard look at this when you consider that it may come here, of course, we hope it does not, and how that staying home is really a proactive approach. But I do thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Nager. What are the symptoms that people need to be on the lookout for so they know what, what coronavirus or COVID-19 actually is, rather than thinking every little bump scrape or cough is? I'm going to let Dr. Uh, Pizzino come up and talk about yep. medical stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, the symptoms are uh, usually described as very similar to the symptom of the flu. So it's fever, severe cough, difficult breathing, and, and general malaise. Those of you who have had the real flu, no, not the flu that you, know, you have a cold, sometimes people call flu just about anything they catch. The real flu, the one caused by the, the virus of influenza, I had that about 30 years ago, I haven't missed a single vaccination ever since, besides the fact I'm a public health doctor, but that was the best lesson for me to learn the importance of vaccination. You feel terrible. So uh, those are really the symptoms that, that should call people's attention. And now it doesn't mean that everyone who has the symptoms, especially during the flu season like we are now, should suspect, oh my gosh, I have coronavirus. Actually, that's the least likely thing that you are going to have today in Shawnee County are much more likely to have other viruses that are causing that. But it's definitely it's one of the things that should be considered. Thank you. Additional questions? Can I make one final comment about testing? You were asking about testing. Just as a general comment, and you know, you can read the details in the media, but uh, um, there hasn't been a lot of testing done in the United States so far, for several reasons that, again, I'm not going to get into. Um, you're probably going to see more testing from this point on, for several reasons. One is that we have more kids available, and two is that we are starting to find cases in some communities, not in Kansas yet, but in other communities. So the more we look for it, the more likely we are to find it. So I want everybody to be prepared to the fact that we may find cases in Kansas, and we may find cases in uh, Shawnee County. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the disease is spreading faster than before. But it may also simply mean that now that we are looking for it, we are going to find it more than before. So don't be surprised. Uh, there will be announcements if there are cases that are confirmed. Yes. Typically, we don't announce when we simply test somebody. As you can imagine, it will get out of control very quickly and would just create anxiety and confusion. Uh, I can just tell you that in Kansas, there have been people under observation because they came back from traveling in uh, some of the affected countries, and they've been uh, under observation as per the protocols of CDC. But those are not the kind of things that you will hear from us publicly. But if there are cases, there will definitely be public information going out. And I would add that we investigate communicable diseases every day. So this is just us doing our jobs. Under the radar screen, and nobody remembers yeah. that they're doing this until something like this happens. Right. So let's remember that. Public health at work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We now move on to the 2020 U.S. Census update. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Well, staff has been uh, assisting and preparing for the city's effort for the complete uh, count uh, for the <coughs> census. Um, Sasha Hahn and Monique Lade have been assisting Councilman Padilla and I, or we're serving as co-chairs for the complete count committee. Um, so we've been working through that process. And so tonight, we plan to talk a little bit about our local efforts 
I'll let uh, Councilman Padilla make some comments before we pass it along to Monique to talk about our local effort. Thank you, City Manager. Mayor, I want to thank you for appointing this committee and putting it in place because it has really helped get a momentum going in the community about the census and the anticipation of, of it coming and the importance of it. Uh, we've been able to uh, identify a number of partners in the community that are helping to spread the word. And if you look on my Facebook page, you can already start to see some of those PSAs that uh, Molly Holland was kind enough to organize and put together. We have a variety of them that I think represents the community. And with uh, the help of Monique and Sasha, they have really been able to put together an, a very uh, aggressive list of activities and ev events and informational cycles that will help get that information out. I would like to, um, if I could, acknowledge uh, in the audience tonight uh, some of our partners. Um, uh, Dorothy Karnowski and Melinda Stanley with the Census Bureau, if you could stand. Uh, 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 Carlos Diaz, who's also with the Census Bureau. Uh, Irene Caballero, who is with Safe Streets and is helping us. Uh, she, in fact, hosts a Spanish-speaking uh, radio program that will air this Friday. Mm -hmm. I think is it? Saturday. Saturday at, on Friday, yes. at, at 930? 930 yeah. 109.1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. Okay, and that will, she'll be joined by Ed Colazzo, who uh, works with the city, and uh, he is very knowledgeable. He's been working with Irene, putting together a lot of facts that may be pertinent to the Latino community to help uh, allay any fears that they may have. And so I want to thank them for their participation and for all their support. And for city staff, uh, Sasha and Monique have really been uh, gangbusters at this and really working well with me. Uh, we've made presentations to the chamber. We have one upcoming to the Rotary. And then we've been invited by Stormont Vale uh, to participate with their uh, employees so we really have a good thing going. I've checked uh, with the uh, Shawnee County uh, Commission and offered to collaborate with them and anything that they have going so that we can make a unified uh, voice about Topeka counts. And so with that, I would defer to staff so they can make their presentation. Monique, if you would please come forward and. <clears throat> you think you can Mark? Okay. Greetings, Madam Mayor, City Manager, and Governing Body. Aside from being the best resource for U.S. population and demographic data, the census also helps determine how much as $675 billion in federal money is allocated each year to states for things such as education, school lunches, health care, hospitals, housing vouchers, roads, and much more. In addition, it will help determine the number of seats each state holds in the U.S. House of Representatives. In 2010, the state of Kansas allocation was $6 billion. Completing the form is simple, especially this year. Filling out the census questionnaire will be easier than ever this year with online and phone options. Topekans can look forward to receiving letters in mid-March. They will receive a unique number to utilize as they complete the form online. In addition, a phone number will be provided for our neighbors who would prefer to answer their census questions via the telephone. 13 languages are available. For hard to reach areas with spotty internet access, a paper questionnaire will be provided in their first mailing to ensure they have plenty of time to respond. If someone accidentally ditches the letter, don't worry, they'll receive several reminders through from starting March 16th and finally starting on May the 13th, anyone who has not responded can expect a knock on the door from a census enumerator who will attempt to count them in person. We want to ensure our neighbors that completing the census 2020 form is safe. Even though a citizenship question won't be included, hype around the issue has caused many unauthorized immigrants to be concerned about their safety participating. The Bureau has assured residents that personal data collected cannot be shared with other agencies, such as Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or the Homeland Security Department. And before it is published, it is stripped of all personal identifiable information. Census records are kept private for 72 years, <coughs> after which the National Archives releases them to the public to be used for genealogy. Our Census 2020 Kansas team partners identified 20 hard-to-count neighborhoods in the city limits. 
that are expected to have a low response rate between 20 and 29 percent. These low expectancy percentages could result in a significant decrease in the distribution of federal funds in our community. In an effort to help emphasize the vital importance of completing the Census 2020 form to our hard to count neighbors, the Department of Neighborhood Relations has created a community education campaign that will be implemented starting April 1st through July 31st. Planned efforts and activities for the hard to count neighborhoods are as follows. We'll be meeting with the 20 neighborhood leaders to talk to them about this concern and to assist them in creating a plan to reach their neighbors to help emphasize the vital importance of the census. Newsletter verbiage will be provided for all neighborhood leaders to insert in their newsletters. Standing banners will be erected in 15 locations that we estimate will reach over 100,000 impressions monthly. Postcards and infographics will be distributed throughout our community as well as silicone wristbands will be provided that will have the, the website and the phone number on them. You will be provided with, uh, with t-shirts along with several City of Topeka team members and community leaders and we ask that you rock those t-shirts as often as possible from April the 1st through July 31st. Thanks to our partners that are here in the audience, the Mayor's Youth Council, some of the members of the Council and the Topeka Youth Commission has informed us that the cool thing now are stickers. Took me back to the 80s when I used to have stickers on everything. And so we will have thousands of stickers and they will help distribute those throughout the community, hopefully to influence their parents and other adults to participate in the census. We'll be erecting real estate corrugated signs throughout the hard to count community, um, asking that the neighbors and businesses put them in high traffic areas as well. Posters will be available for churches, businesses, and other organizations. And my team and I will host pop-up sessions where we pro provide technology for people to be able to take the census on the spot. Ensuring that all of our neighbors are informed about the 2020 census is a huge feat that we can't do alone. And we're seeking support from our community partners. We'd appreciate their efforts in allowing their employees to complete the census form while at work, sharing information with their respective organizations and clientele, and we have a big wish list. On the wish list, we'd like to have two large community events really emphasizing to the parents to participate and to other adults in completing the census form. We've applied for a possible match donation from a local partner, and we'll hopefully hear before the end of the month that they will be participating, and we welcome any other financial donors. And in conclusion, I'd like to remind everyone that Topeka Counts, please make your voice count and take the 2020 census. I'd be glad to answer any questions or would invite the Census 2020 Kansas team to answer questions for you. Questions for Monique or the Census team. I want to make sure that I want to thank Councilman Padilla for saying yes and doing such an admirable job. Um, and then, of course, for our neighbors that happen not to have documentation, I will tell them que tu voto cuenta, I mean, tu censo cuenta. Es importante que marques la cantidad de gente que tienes en tu casa porque muchísimos dólares que vienen a la ciudad de Topeka y el estado de Kansas cuentan con que tú y tu familia se registren en el censo. Así que por favor, por favor, no les va a causar ningún problema legal, por favor, regístrense con el censo. Councilwoman Heller. I thought you had your hand up. Additional questions? Councilwoman Padilla. Not a question, but uh, I neglected to add, uh, add one more partner that we uh, have too. Uh, oftentimes, in this audience, we see an awful lot of yellow shirts from the JUMP organization. And I think they represent 24, 26 ministries. And uh, I made the ask of them this time to use that organization to get the information out to all of their congregations and to spread it that way, too. So we've got another organization that is networking through the city. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. You must welcome. Thank you very much. You must welcome. Sure. Public Works 2019 year-end report, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, tonight, Brian Faust, our city engineer, is here to give us our year-end report and talk about the projects and accomplishments we had and what we look forward to for next year. Brian. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to talk with you this evening about many of the projects and activities that we completed in 2019 and to take a look at some of the projects we have planned for the upcoming year. A number of projects across the city were completed in 2019. Uh, this look, list will look very familiar to what we presented in December. It's reorganized to highlight the four spokes of our pavement management plan. 
Uh, those are preventative maintenance, major rehabilitation, <coughs> reconstruction, and stopgap measures. We do highlight two in red that are winterizing. Those projects were shut down going into the winter months, and they both should start up later this month in March, assuming the weather holds that it is right now. In 2020, we do anticipate another very robust construction season that again covers all the components of our pavement management plan. Under reconstruction, we've actually highlighted six projects. Five of these projects will start in 2020 and should be completed in 2020. The bottom project in red, Southwest 10th, between Fairlawn and Wanamaker, is actually a two-year project. It'll start in 2020 and be completed in 2021. If you've been out there recently, there's been a lot of construction associated with utility relocations, um, but that project should start later this summer. Uh, 2020 projects on the left side is Southeast California from 37th to 45th. Uh, design will start later this spring with construction scheduled for 2022. When this road is finished, it'll look very similar to California from 33rd to 37th, a three lane section with both a sidewalk and a shared use path. Uh, the road on the right is actually within Chesney Park phase two. Uh, this year project goes from 17th to 21st between Clay and the Expo Center. And this project includes storm sewer replacement, base patching curb work, and finally a mill and overlay. Uh, we do have two projects on Kansas Avenue scheduled for construction in 2020. Uh, the first one is from Curtis to Norris, and that's on the south edge of the Noto District. And the second one is actually from Morris to Soldier Creek, which is north of the Noto District. Uh, both projects include the installation of sidewalks to complete the connectivity on both sides of the street for the project limits. Uh, two more reconstruction projects, the Southeast Carnahan between the I-70 ramps. Uh, this is uh, right by Reesers Fine Foods. Uh, the the semi-trucks through there have done quite a bit of uh, wear and tear on the roadway. And so we'll re be reconstructing that is scheduled to start around July 6th, right after the fourth weekend. Uh, the other section, Southeast Deer Creek Parkway, 6th to 10th, uh, is actually a major rehabilitation project. There'll be base patching, some curb work, and then a mill and overlay. Uh, the project that actually takes two years um, is Southwest 10th Street. Uh, the view on the left is the current condition of the roadway. It's a two-lane rural section with open ditches. Uh, when it's done in 2021, it will look like the section on the right. This was completed in 2017, again, Southwest 10th. That picture is between Gage and Fairlawn. Uh, internal services back in 2019 um, ordered a total of seven new vehicles and equipment. In the fourth quarter, this included both a sweeper and a transit van. Uh, the view on the left is our old sweeper. And the view on the right is the new sweeper we received. Our street and traffic operations, along with our forestry divisions, uh, had a very busy year in 2019. Uh, you can see by the tables the work that they completed. Uh, street crews, independent of our outside contractor, crack sealed over 21,000 linear feet of pavement in the fourth quarter. Our forestry division pruned over 400 trees and our traffic operations continued striping, signal inspection, and repairs. And this is kind of a view of what they do. Now on the left, you'll see pruning of a tree uh, way up. Uh, the center picture is actually of a working on a traffic signal. And on the right, you'll see one of our guys in crack ceiling. With that, happy to answer. Any questions you might have? Questions or comments from the governing body? Councilwoman Valdivia Alcara. Um, can you tell me on the 2019 projects, if you go back and look at the Oakland neighborhood, it has curbs, alleys, and mill overlay complete. So I know the mill overlay, um, what exactly in, was entailed with the alleys? Because I continue to get a number of calls 
with big craters in our alleys. And so can you tell me how far reaching that was? Sure, we did a number of alley approaches within the Oakland area. We did repave um, at least one alley within Oakland. Um, there are a number of alleys that have a variety of different types of material, surface materials that might be gravel, that might be millings, could be asphalt or concrete or even brick. Um, for the most part, we didn't touch those as part of that project, but our traffic operations and street operations folks did. Uh, they do have a program to uh, regrade alleys, and so they do that. I think they try to get it twice a year. Yeah, twice a year. Okay, so that's separate from what you're talking about here, what traffic was able to do. Correct. Okay, so like how many alleys do you think you did in 2019 in Oakland? As far as uh, engineering projects with contained within here? What you're talking about contained in this? Oh, in, 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 in this part operations. of the report you just gave. Okay. Um, you would have to go back. It's page two. Okay. Um, I'm thinking we were in the 20 plus on the alley approaches. Um, I know we did completely reconstruct <laughs> and then pave one alley uh, next to the church off of Seward Avenue. Okay. But for exact numbers, I'd have to I'd get this for you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional comment? Yeah, Councilwoman Nager. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, for reconstruction projects, mm -hmm. what all is entailed with those? I know that we're talking a lot about the maintenance of the streets, but obviously with public works, we're talking more than just street maintenance. We're talking about um, the sewers and the water lines and all of that. What all is included in a reconstruction project? What we do when we look at a reconstruction project that we made a determination that it's not really a candidate for preventive maintenance or mm -hmm. major rehab like a mill and overlay. Mm -hmm. Made that determination that we need to completely reconstruct. Well, the first thing we do is get with our utility department and have them look at kind of the break history on the water line, how old the sewer lines are. Because we want to make sure that when we do a reconstruction project, we don't reconstruct the surface and then have failures underneath. So it's kind of a, we work very close with our utilities department. But again, it's a complete reconstruction. It can be sewer, it can be water, it can be storm sewers, and then a reconstruction of the road itself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Seeing no other questions, thank you so much for the presentation. <coughs> Last item, the financial services. Uh, city Manager. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Jessica Lamandoa, our Director of Financial Administrative Services, will give you the fourth quarter report. Thank you. Okay. So um, just as clarification, this is not audited. This is um, just a year-end cash basis review, which means by the time you get the audit in a few months, there could be, um, there will be adjustments related to GASB and other items that may impact the um, balance sheet versus just the revenue and expense statement. Um, so this is high level view looking at our main funds, including the utility funds. And for me, it really represents the teamwork um, that I've experienced here at the city. Um, going from department to department, <coughs> management, city council. Um, you know, if you look down at the general fund, we are currently anticipating on a cash basis at least um, a surplus um, and I think you know that is just reflective of the team coming together in the last quarter of the year looking at expenses looking at different ways that they could fund projects um, and then on the revenue side uh, planning was extremely busy in terms of permits um, so we from that perspective got kind of lucky because that was um, able to offset some of the lower performance from other revenue sources um, debt service fund we'll get into that and then just overall it was a good it ended up being a good year because people were dedicated to it being a good year I just want to stress that okay. so again this is um, year over year variance we're not looking at budget at this point property tax came in higher than last year um, license and permits like I mentioned higher than last year miscellaneous higher and then both franchise 
there's a spelling error. Both franchise fees and sales tax coming in under compared to the previous year. Um, on the expense side, uh, no big surprises here. These are all within budgeted amounts, but when you compare to the prior year, there was a growth. So to get into a little bit more detail, property tax, this primarily reflects growth within the community. So I don't think that's surprising given some of our permit activity. Um, planning was, was very busy and I think that they would attest to that. So we're hopeful that we'll see continued activity into 2020. On the miscellaneous side, uh, you know, we again budgeted conserv conservatively on the investment income. We saw some good growth there. The temporary note proceeds was the short-term note that the council approved in the fourth quarter, um, basically reimbursing ourselves for um, projects that have been completed in the past. Um, small uh, sale of assets and then just various other income coming in over. And then again, negative year over year is that sales tax number. Um, on a positive note, the last two checks we've seen um, good growth. Um, the last check itself basically accounts for the surplus that we're reflecting at year end. So we're hopeful prior to this week <laughs> in the Fed cut that we would see some growth in investment income at least meeting our budget target. Um, obviously that, that uh, rate cut could impact year end results, but we will adjust throughout the year and you know focus on coming in balanced. And then franchise fees continues to be um, a challenge. So that's just an area that we have to refocus on and and continue to figure out what's the underlying cause and whether that reflects just a budget adjustment, if that's just the activity that we should expect or whether there's an underlying cause. So we'll, we'll give more updates on that throughout the year. Um, so on the debt service fund, consistent with the general fund, we saw growth in the underlying property tax base. Um, special assessments, this is, don't get excited, this is a one-time issue. Um, the uh, Go Greater Topeka is repaying a special assessment early. So we will be working with um, identifying um, <coughs> with our with Columbia Capital and Bond Council to identify an escrow account. So that is a one-time, it just came in and it has to go back out for debt service. And then um, we'll talk about this later in the presentation, but on the miscellaneous revenue, this reflects um, both finance and public works staff really focused on closing out projects. And I just want to highlight Rochelle in my office, Kristen in finance, Dan and Barbie and public works amongst a larger group, but you know they were really dedicated to, to closing out projects and we'll be able to redeploy those assets. So then in terms of utility funds, um, as we would expect, Revenue was down slightly compared to the prior year, um, given the increased rainfall. Um, but overall, they were able to manage their expense to match their revenue. Stormwater, they saw some growth, largely reflecting the rate increase. Yes. Do, we, do we have it somewhere? In um, yes. Uh, you have your, the presentation. I. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just got to where we couldn't read it anymore on the screen. Um, you should have it. I can ask. Liz is still here. It is okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. If not, we can get it to you afterwards. That's but fine. I believe it was distributed last week. Um, so stormwater, we saw growth largely reflective of the fee increase. Um, but overall, on the expense side, consistent with what we would expect given the budget that was approved. Um, on the wastewater side, again, we saw an increase in revenue consistent um, and reflective of the fee increase that was approved a prior year. Expenses in line with what we would expect. So as I was mentioning on the capital project side, this is an area of focus for us. Um, compared to 1231 of 2018, open pro capital projects have been reduced by 15% or a net 84 projects. So that reflects opening and closing. So um, that means that we've identified about $1.8 million that would have likely been previously borrowed. Projects were closed, they came in under budget, they were delayed or ended. And so we'll be able to um, redeploy those into other projects, capital asset. Um, infrastructure goals. 
and then overall you can see that we added a pretty significant amount to our capitalized infrastructure as well. And so these are some of those main, the main projects that uh, were completed during the year. I think Public Works gave a, a very good summary. Um, and then you can see some of the water, stormwater, and water pollution projects. So. That is the summary presentation. Obviously, there's a lot in there. The report is much longer. Um, we're, we're closing out the fiscal year. We'll be presenting the, the CAFR in, I believe, May, which will reflect all of the year-end adjustments. This is just on a cash basis. Um, but I'm open for questions, areas of concern, want more information. Um, we can give that information for you. Questions? Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. Well, congratulations for bringing us in for a landing first. You it was and a team effort. Team effort. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you, you addressed a question that I was going to ask, um, and that was about the outstanding projects. Now, are the ones that you said the staff closed out in the last couple of weeks closed out in the book that we got? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and this is really just a question. It's something that's troubled me over time. I mean, there are many projects that are still open in this book that were open in like 2013, mm -hmm. 2014, 2015. Has there been an internal, um, and sometimes these are out of date. I'm guessing that they're up to date with what you said, but where it says closing or design and so on. Is there an internal goal to reduce this even further uh, for 2020? I believe the, well, the internal goal would be to have open projects that are currently open, right, that sure. are continuing to be worked on. Um, as you know, our staff um, has a lot of priorities and um, areas of focus, but uh, Rochelle and um, Kristen in my office and then the, you know, Dan and Public Works and Barbie and others, they continue to focus on it. And I think, um, I think everybody was very excited about the project, quite frankly, you know, mm -hmm. after the parameters were, um, decided and um, we, just additional information provided in terms of the outcome we wanted. Um, I think it it only leads to additional assets being put back into the system. I, I don't think you can have a better outcome than that. Exactly. I mean, years ago, this was like 10 pages long, and we all just kind of went, what? And it turned out that it was the, the closeouts and the documents were slow coming from Public Works to finance. It wasn't just a a finance issue and and we they reduced it at one point I don't watch it like a hawk or count but it seemed like this was still a pretty long list and so just what wondered I mean I would say that the city's active we have a lot of projects we have a lot of um, infrastructure needs um, I think that going through the process obviously um, highlights areas of weakness on on all sides and it also gives us the opportunity to improve those sure so I mean, I think it's, I, again, I think it's a win-win. It's one of those that if we had additional staff or more time, could we possibly close out more projects more quickly? <coughs> Probably. But I think given the staff and uh, availability of time and resources, this is, for the last six months of the year, this is an excellent outcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional comments or questions? Seeing none, thank you for the presentation. We now move on to the consent agenda, if the clerk would read. A is a resolution introduced by Council Member Karen Hiller approving a special event known as the 2020 Modern Day Irish Fest. B is a resolution introduced by Council Member Karen Hiller approving a special event known as the 99.3 The Eagle Cruise Night 2020. C is a resolution introduced by Council Member Karen Hiller granting cumulus broadcasting an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-170 concerning noise prohibitions. D, our minutes have the regular meeting of February 18, 2020. There is a list of open after midnight permits in front of you and staff is recommend uh, approved. We have heard the consent agenda. What is the, thank you Councilman Lesser made a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second by Councilman Dobler. Thank you for rescuing that. <laughs> it's just a consent agenda, friends. <laughs> um, all right, so we have a motion and a second. Any comments or discussion on the item? Seeing none, we proceed by voting. We have seven 
yes. Seven having voting yes, the motion passes. We now move on to the non-action item. Item A, if the clerk would read. A is discussion on the demolition of the structures located at 1104 and 1108 Southwest <coughs> Western Avenue, located within the boundaries of the Holiday Park National Historic District within the City of Topeka, pursuant to KSA 752724. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Tonight, we have a presentation on a request from staff to approve the demolition of two damaged homes um, at 1104 and 1108 Southwest Western Avenue. Staff will discuss the need and action taken to get to this point. The item is uh, scheduled to come back next week for action. Bill? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. City Manager. Uh, good evening. I'm going to uh, partner with uh, Director Sasha Hahn, Neighborhood Relations. Um, I'm going to start out by just kind of frameworking it so you understand what it is that you're being asked, why is this before you, what's your role, um, and then Sasha will hit on uh, the details of, of those two properties and, and the status. So uh, some of you have not heard this sort of a um, case before and others that have, it's been a while, so just want to refresh everybody. Um, so next week you'll be deciding on whether or not to approve or deny two demolitions within a National Historic District. In this case, that's the Holiday Park uh, National Historic District. Um, the city, through neighborhood relations, had requested these demolitions uh, that Sasha will go over, uh, but for, really for safety reasons in this case. Uh, and so it is before you because uh, to approve demolitions in a historic district like this, it does need to go through um, and in this case, it went through State Historic Preservation Office. Typically, it goes through our local Landmarks Commission. In this case, it got expedited through the state. Um, and they have, then they have findings to make to allow or deny um, such, a, such a request for demolition. Uh, they have to uh, note that it does or does not make, have any damage or destroy the integrity of the district. That's really hard to do when you're demolishing structures and there's no replacement behind it. So, um, so that finding was made by them. Uh, the city uh, neighborhood relations appeals that decision and state law affords that then to come to you uh, to be the uh, uh, arbiter of, of that appeal. Um, and as you can probably assume that, I mean, typically we don't want to support or not too supportive of demolitions in historic districts. Uh, kind of defeats the purpose of those districts uh, that is intended to protect those assets. However, there are cases that do come along. Uh, that's why they're at your, uh, on your agenda to decide whether or not um, they meet the findings uh, of an appeal. And you have different findings. You have two findings to make that are different from the state or the Landmarks Commission. It's a, it's, a different bar, uh, a little lower bar, if you will, but you just have to find that there are no prudent or feasible alternatives to that demolition and that all planning has been, reasonable planning has been done to minimize harm to the district. Um, so those are your findings that you have to make um, and some of the factors that go into those findings will be a little more obvious or evident. Uh, I'll ask Sasha to come up and talk about the details of those properties. Thank you. Any questions about the process before we jump into this, the properties? Seeing no questions, Ms. Hahn. Okay. Your Honor, governing body members, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to just share this information and kind of explain the process to you. Um, so I want to start, start by showing you some pictures of uh, the properties. We'll start with 1104 um, Southwest Western. So. Just to give you an aerial perspective, this is about 11th and Western Avenue, but um, the, sorry, I pre-apologized to you guys for my technology capabilities. So just to give you an idea of the damage to the structure, it's heavily fire damaged and we wanted to be able to show you that. So short of taking you on a field trip, we brought you some pictures that you could see of the structure to get an idea of why we are appealing the state's decision um, regarding the demolition of the property. So on uh, all of this information was included in your packet, but I'm going to give you a brief overview. On December 8th, the 1104 Southwest Western pro property caught fire and 
This is the resulting damage. Uh, our property maintenance division went out immediately the next day and inspected it. We then initiated a uh, dangerous structures case against the property. We notified the property owner on December 16th according to our process. And then the State Historical Preservation Office also chimed in through the planning department on the 16th of December. On January 8th, we had an administrative hearing. As part of our normal process for dangerous structure determinations, the property owner is provided a administrative hearing with a hearing officer. So they automatically get that, um, that privilege, privilege is not the right word, but we have them come and, and, and present their side of the case to an administrative hearing officer. Um, the administrative hearing officer did support our request for a, demoli a dangerous structure determination and a demolition order. In this particular case, the property owner is uh, supportive of the demolition and awaits the decision of the governing body. He's already contacted a demolition contractor and is ready to go on this as soon as the council votes to approve the ability to demo the property. Just some more pictures of the interior of the 1104 structure. And then 1108, right next door. So basically, when the 1104 house caught on fire, it caught the 1108 house on fire and caused extensive damage as well. Uh, we've provided pictures of the interior to give you an idea of the condition of the property. So the exact same timeline. December 9th, our inspectors inspected the property. December 16th, we provided notice to the property owner um, of our dangerous structures case and, and the administrative hearing process. Um, on January 6th, in this particular case, SHPO notified the city of their denial of our request for demolition. And then January 8th was the administrative hearing. We did not have the property owner um, present at that hearing, but they are supportive of the demolition and feel that that's the best solution for these properties. Um, so we've provided for you the information why moving the structures are not feasible. We've explained in the executive summary how we come to the determination that demolition is the appropriate solution. We receive the replacement costs, new information that's included in the packet materials from Shawnee County. So the county tells us what they believe it would cost to replace the structure and then we do our calculations off of that number. Anytime that the replacement cost new exceeds a 30% standard, then we determine that it is too costly to rehabilitate the property and we pursue a dangerous structure determination. So that is the process in a nutshell. Again, as Bill mentioned, we just wanted to kind of highlight the process for you. We have some new members that haven't gone through this particular type of action with the body, so we wanted to be sure that everyone had the opportunity to ask questions before we asked you to vote. We will be asking you to take action at next week's meeting, and staff does recommend de demolition of both structures. Happy this, to answer any questions. This is just a discussion item. As we know, there's no action that's going to be taken this evening, but it's good time for discussion. Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. Would it be you or Bill, or is there still another piece? Because you all did step in and do the notification to the historic district, and which is a really important part of that process to share. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we, okay. we did. Um, as part of our policy, we notify the historic district owners. We got a, l a little uh, behind doing that, but nonetheless, we did that about th um, uh, two, two and a half weeks ago. Because um, <clears throat> it didn't come through our local process, with, it was an oversight. We got back on it, thanks to some, some uh, encouragement, uh, and uh, notified all the property owners. We actually did get a inquiry on one of the properties to see if it was worth uh, rehabilitating. So we, we passed that along to uh, Sasha's staff. And uh, I think, um, uh, I haven't heard anything since then, but we did get a we did get a an inquiry. 
Um, well, it would be good for everybody to know about the inquiry and also to know if you got feedback from the residents of the historic district. We did. Uh, there was um, a, uh, I guess, a recommendation of support uh, for the demolition. They also are, and this is the neighbor, neighborhood uh, officials, uh, okay. I guess. Th thank you, the NIA uh, leaders. Uh, that um, if there was a way to also have those vacant properties be part of the adjacent um, Adjacent properties where homes are, so they could be somebody's yard as opposed to be a vacant lot that's going to have to be mowed and over and over again. That would be fantastic, and we agree. Uh, in this case, we don't have that. The city doesn't own the property, so it's, we, it's hard for us to mandate that, but um, I believe that is something that we, we would all support if that was to happen. Um, it does not preclude someone from coming along later uh, and doing an infill house there at all, uh, but it would at least not let it become an eyesore in the near future. Well, and I wanted to, to thank you for that mm -hmm. process, and mm -hmm. I wanted everybody to know that that's, that step-by-step -step this council set up really kind of like the zoning hearings not all that many years ago to make sure it always happened, and it, it does make a difference. And <clears throat> just so that you know across the table, I got <clears throat> got some had some contacts some time ago, and, and you're aware of those, but um, had one today from a gentleman who lives right across the street who wanted to express, he couldn't come tonight, but uh, express his appreciation for the respect for the historic district. And also, again, he lives right across the street. He'd be more than happy to have him go down. <laughs> so I wanted people to know that. Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. <clears throat> when a demolition uh, takes place, what actually happens? I mean, the bulldozers go in and it knocks everything down and nothing is saved or I've been watching too many do-it-yourself shows uh, <laughs> repurposed because I'm to other maybe contractors that do renovations on homes or anything of that nature and I ask the question because I see in some of the areas not all of the woodwork is completely you know, uh, burnt. I mean, I don't know how much smell would have gone into it. And I also see the pictures of this bathtub and this, what looks like a vintage, you know, uh, sink. I know that these are very small questions, mm -hmm. but when demolition occurs, I mean, is everything grazed and, and nothing is looked at for saving or? So t typically the answer is yes, I feel your pain. We demoed a house in Oakland that had the most beautiful staircase in the world, but we couldn't save it. Um, the important thing to remember is this isn't our property. So if the property owner wanted to maybe salvage some of those pieces and parts, they would be allowed to do that. Our contractors, because we do contract the service out, um, our, we contract with them to clear the lot. And so all, all the debris has to be gone. But we don't specify what happens to the inside of the structure because we don't own it. Mm -hmm. But I, I uh, have had conversations in the past about there's a name of what that's called deconstruction for rehabilitation or something those are amazing programs that they have across the country i don't know that we're quite there yet but it's definitely something that we think about and talk about internally okay just curious thanks yes ma'am councilwoman nager <laughs> thank you madam mayor a couple questions um what is the Obviously, these structures are not adding any value to the neighboring lots or properties at this point. With the um, demolition and not really having a straightforward plan for what's going to happen next for these lots, what is the expected effect on the property owners who are neighboring these two um, properties at this point? That's a good question. Um, I, I don't know that it would, the demolition won't necessarily hurt their property mm -hmm. values if that's but you're kind mm -hmm. of talking about that property value piece because having a blighted, dilapidated, or half-burnt structure next to your house probably would be more of a detractor from the value than just a cleared lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's privately owned property, we mm -hmm. can't, as Bill mentioned, we can't force them to give it to the neighbor or mm -hmm. do anything with it, really. But I, I do believe that the property values would be positively impacted by getting rid of the blighted structure that's there. Okay. Okay. Um, as far as if somebody did want to develop on one of these lots, 
are there certain restrictions because it is a historic um, district for the unfelt buildings? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, the historic district, any historic district, has to follow the National Park Service standards set up by uh, National Park Service. Uh, and so that uh, there's eight or nine of those standards they have to meet. So we don't have any specific guidance more specific guidance for this district. We do, for instance, downtown. This district, we don't. It's a general, the general park service standards uh, that gets approved by our local landmarks commission when it comes through. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And then as far as demolition, who covers the cost for demolition? Um, so the demolition order gives the property owner 30 days to comply. And if they don't comply in um, in 30 days, then we start the process. Mm -hmm. if, the, uh, if the city has to demo it, then we bill the owner after that project is over, and we give them 30 days to pay. If they don't pay that bill to the city, then we assess those fees to property taxes, and we send them to collections. Whichever one pays us first, then the other one gets just canceled. So right. that's how that works. Awesome. Thank you both. You're very well. Thank you. Great questions. Councilwoman Hiller. One quick follow-up, I think, to you. Um, sometimes people are willing to invest quite a bit of money in rehabbing a house that most people from the outside would think has isn't worth it. Um, what happened to the one person who was interested? You know, that is, is not something that my staff passed on to me, so okay. my suspicion would be that it was somebody fishing, a speculator. But I'll get more information. It'd probably be good to know. Yep. And, and we'll provide it to city manager so he can distribute it to the body. Thank you. <coughs> Seeing no other questions, thank you very much for the presentation. We now move on to item B, if the clerk would read. <coughs> B is discussion on the governance of operations at the Topeka Zoo. City managers. Thank you, Mayor. Um, there have been a number of meetings considering the issue of a change in governance for the zoo. Um, tonight I'm going to have staff do a presentation on the details that, uh, uh, but wanted to first of all to let you know that I support this change that's being considered in the governance of the zoo to FOTS. Um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Doug to begin staff's presentation, and I see that Brendan and, and Fred Patton are here also, and I believe they have a portion of this for answer questions. Before we start, I know that you mentioned his name, but I would like to acknowledge Representative Fred Patton being in the room. Thank you for being here. Mayor, thank you. Good evening. Uh, Gar <laughs> City Council. Um, stole my introductory remarks, too. Brendan and Fred are here. and. Uh, are certainly much more knowledgeable about many aspects of this. Um, I'd particularly like to recognize Fred this evening for spending his evening with us when he should be celebrating his birthday. So we, we may <laughs> could sing to him this evening. And so uh, with that in mind, yeah, as the governing body knows, when, when I come before you, with the project, I like to sort of look back to where we've been uh, so that we can look forward. And so if you recall back to the last time we talked about it in this group, we started talking about uh, a pie analogy, right? So I don't know if Fred's a birthday cake or a birthday pie kind of guy, uh, but I know that uh, four of my daughters have birthdays in February, and so we've been making a lot of pies at our house and cakes. <laughs> And uh, one of the things that we didn't do well recently was put enough cornstarch in the pie. And so uh, it was soupy and not very delicious. So uh, the reason I tell you that story is, is, again, as you recall, the last time we talked about this, there, was a, it's, there, there really is a point. Uh, there was a pie analogy. <laughs> and uh, Councilwoman Ortiz, I remember saying very clearly, Doug, we want to know what's in the pie. And so... We want to make sure the right ingredients are in the pie. So that, that's the last time I'll talk about pie tonight, except to say that uh, we have been spending the last couple of months trying to make sure that we have the pie ingredients for you and that the right ingredients are in there. And that took the form of the license agreement, which we have been discussing with the governing body over the last uh, 
week, really, we've given you those those details. So we set about developing that, and I, I use the royal we in this particular case. Uh, certainly Lisa Robertson, our city attorney, wrote the bulk of it uh, with some minor input from Brendan and myself and, and Jessica, but uh, Lisa deserves the, the credit for putting together a, what I think is a well-crafted document. Uh, additionally, uh, in addition to putting together the license agreement, we have been talking with our bargaining unit about how uh, that might look for their future transition to FOTS if such a thing were to happen. Uh, as we talked about, we have been having these meetings with the governing body, and uh, we wrapped those up yesterday. A number of issues, issues were identified, and uh, we don't have it for you tonight since we just finished those meetings yesterday, but we do have a list of questions that we put together and uh, we'll be compiling those questions along with answers and then presenting that to the governing body at a future meeting so that we can talk through that once again so that uh, everybody can see exactly what was asked by everyone else. Uh, I think it's fair to say and hopefully everyone agrees that there was general support for continuing to move forward with this but there were a lot of questions still. Um, and without getting too very specific about those questions, some of the things that I think we heard were, um, you know, who should own the facility? If this happens, who should own them? Should the city own them? Should FOTS own them? Who should own the animals? Um, <clears throat> one of the questions we heard was, how can we make sure that this doesn't take the form of some of our previous agreements and that, you know, it's actually well-crafted and protects all parties moving forward? So I think that's something that obviously we need to be, be cognizant of. Um, there was a question from uh, related to outstanding debt, and so we're working on putting that together in terms of what the zoo has in terms of outstanding debt. There was uh, time spent with all the groups that we met with talking about <coughs> board representation, and I think it's fair to say there's a variety of opinions as to how that should look. So we'll, we'll wrestle with that when the time comes. And then there were a number of employee transition questions. Again, how, how were, will our current employees be treated and how will they be treated in the future? So again, w we are compiling those and we will present uh, a more comprehensive list to you in uh, what I hope is the near future. So in terms of uh, a future timetable or the next steps, we're viewing this tonight as an opportunity for you as a group to ask any questions that you might have right now. And also just as one more touch point for everyone to make sure that everyone continues to be comfortable with moving down this road. So assuming we hear those things this evening, um, future timetable would include continued negotiations, discussions with AFT, with the bargaining unit. Uh, we need to finalize the financial information in the document. We talked with each of you how that's not complete yet and we're trying to coordinate that with our CIP process as to how that might look. Uh, we need to find out, finalize the asset list in terms of animals owned, property owned, all the way down to things like computers and working out details like that. Uh, there's just a lot of moving pieces to this. And then um, finalize and, and be able to talk more articulately, articulately say that three times fast, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, the ownership question, you know, should it be the city, should it be FOTS, is there a hybrid that works, works best for folks. Um, so we intend to uh, get all that stuff into uh, another draft of the license agreement for presentation to this body. Uh, so we will have uh, a minimum of one, but more likely uh, more than one additional public discussions with this body prior to us asking you to take any action. And again, as we've talked about, if, if action moves forward, it would consist of improvement or a consideration of the license agreement, um, changes to the city code, and changes to the AFT bargaining agreement. Uh, in an ideal world, those would uh, precede the 2021 operating budget or at, at a minimum run concurrent with those. And so we're likely looking at a uh, May timeframe to try to bring this to more of a conclusion, May slash June. So uh, 
I think uh, I've given you the overview that I'd like to. Uh, certainly myself or Fred or Brendan are available. Either one of those two can step up if I've missed anything and we're uh, ready and able to answer questions you might have. Any questions? Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm one of the ones that doesn't like the agreement, so I don't want it out there that I do. Um, I do have some questions, though, and I know that we started uh, looking at this bargaining unit employees, and I knew I know that I had questions about AFT and these, I think you said 20 to 22 employees that are going to uh, lose um, their union uh, protection. And I do, another question that I'm looking at as I look over this draft is section 7.2 about bargaining unit employees. And I've read it over a couple of times. And I'm wondering how it differs. Obviously, the public can't see this, but um, how it differs from section 7.4A under responsibility. Because my understanding was that the zoo employees, if this is to take, if this is to work the way y'all are talking, um, would all go over to FOTS, losing union coverage, those that have it. But then under 7.4a, I'm, I'm not clear, because it does talk about um, those that would still be in city uh, employment. And again, I'm not a lawyer. So I'm just asking if we could, if I could get clarification on that, maybe not necessarily now, but for next week's meeting, um, because that's confusing to me. Um, Councilwoman, other... we can give clarification now if, okay. if, if you're sure. comfortable with that. Sure. In, just in a very general sense, the ideal uh, for the agreement is that employees transfer from the city to FOTS. However, uh, as we've talked about, we want to make sure we treat folks fairly and appropriately. And so we looked at employees who may be uh, close to retiring under the CAPER system and, and set a date of anyone within uh, a retirement date of three years could choose to remain a city employee until such time that they retired and then that position would transfer to Fox. And so. I'll look to the city attorney and make sure I'm, I'm interpreting that right. But the intent then is that if those three employees would remain city employees, that FOTS would honor the terms of the contract. Okay, so they would stay in city employment. And are any of these union positions, any of these three that you're referring to? Yes, ma'am. And so they would get continue with the AFT union being employed with the city? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, thank you for that. The, we will spell that out as well in the as questions. Once we get past this draft point. Yes. The other question I have is, well, actually, I don't think it's so much a question as it is a concern. Uh, going through a number of articles I've been reading uh, between private-public partnerships, I have a real concern about, even though you're negotiating with AFT, about the losing of the union uh, support, the bargaining rights, things of that nature, that vulnerability that it leaves in place. I understand that you all said that there is going to be, and you may remind me exactly how you worded it, a human resources component added if there is some type of conflict. Hi. Councilwoman, first, uh, thank you all for the time that you spent in these meetings. And maybe I need to uh, clear up. I think when you asked that question, I might have answered, answered prematurely. What was your specific question about that? You were concerned that people would lose the protection of the union. Right. And because well, that is true. Mm -hmm. um, there will be safeguards that FOTS will have in place to protect the employees, uh, ranging from a very similar 
uh, disciplinary system that's used within the city system today, all the way to an anonymous reporting process that employees will be able to use. Okay, there was made mention of some, was it an HR consultant? Is that what I'm There's remembering? There's a local firm here in Topeka called HR Partners. They are who Friends of the Zoo uses to manage their anonymous system. And they would come in in place of any type of union protection that they now won't, these workers now won't have, correct? Correct, although they do represent Friends of the Zoo. Right, like any HR department is going to represent its entity that it works for, right. Correct. Okay, um, so thank you for that. The, the other thing that I, I'm concerned about with this privatization is that um, as new employees are brought in that there may be, you may start seeing a slow decrease in in wages, um, and is is there anything that's going to be built into? I mean, I know you've said that your wages are competitive and all of that, but privatization always scares me in that way, where you start seeing wages and benefits uh, go down. And I uh, just wanted to understand a little bit uh, more about that. So I guess I'll try to answer as somebody that's worked both government and nonprofit um, positions before. All of the budget modeling we have done uh, anticipates current starting wages that we use today for future employees. We've done a budget model out five years, and our expectation is that we are going to hire well-qualified the best that we can hire that are going to demand competitive wages. Will those, but, will those wages usually be starting more than $16 an hour? No. Okay. And I say that because um, the zookeeper profession is largely underpaid. I've read that. And we pay above the competitive, I'm sorry, we pay above the average wage today that is, I believe, the starting wage for a zookeeper is either 15.32 or 15.50 an hour. Um, I don't know that we plan on increasing the starting salary uh, within that five-year model. Yeah, I had been reading that, that it is a low wage profession. <clears throat> However, what some zoos have done is that they have increased the benefits and the vacation time to kind of account for the low wage that is being paid. My concern, and obviously I didn't know how much our zoo people, our zoo employees were getting paid here. My concern is that, and this does correlate, so bear with me here, in the housing study that we have just had done in this city, it is stating that $16 an hour is a bare minimum to afford a two-bedroom unit of safe and decent quality. So I guess I'm, you know, saying it for, on the part of the city and, and the low wage, but um, also as, you know, however this ends up working out, uh, these wages just don't appear to be living wages. Amen. So, and that's unfortunate. Personally, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, it, it's bizarre that you can post a $15.50 an hour position and attract people from across the country yeah. for that job. But it speaks to the state of the industry. Yeah. Do you know at all if, uh, and this would be a question for, for maybe city and thoughts or do you know if that money that Jado is talking about and if you have a zoo professional that wants to move and the money that uh, Jado gave to, I think it was, uh, Go Topeka for moving expenses, would, would that be something that you all could tap into to, to get somebody to move here for these positions? 
I'm just a shot in the dark. Just I don't know, but I would be, if nobody else knows, I would be happy to explore that. Okay. You um, have to pay half of it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Um, there is, I know that when you and I were talking, when I went in for the meeting, and um, you were talking about some of the issues with the zoo funding, you know, coming out of the general fund and, you know, not feeling comfortable with that process. But if you had to think of three of the main strongest reasons for this to happen, for this public-private partnership to happen, and I know we have a lot of material here, but I'm asking you, what do you think, the th you know, like three of the most important reasons why this should happen? Budget compression. The fact that we can't sustain operational growth, that would be number two. So budget compression, number one. Uh, we can't sustain operational growth parallel to infrastructure growth would be issue number three. And please keep in mind, this is just my perspective. I understand. And my personal slash professional as a zoo person uh, perspective is that it's not the right funding source for a zoo with the user base that we have. Okay. So I think I have those. I think I missed the third one, but I think I have the the other two and then the one that you just mentioned. And I have um, one more question. Since we've been talking about all week and with all the information that we've been given um, on all aspects of the zoo, uh, Friends of the Topeka Zoo, its history, City of Topeka history, and uh, obtaining the gauge uh, property, um, the public-private partnership uh, first came up on the radar, I think it was back in 2009. Uh, it's come up every, you know, every so often since then. And um, feeling that there, the question I'm going to ask you is definitely a correlation to this. You are aware of the residency ordinance that the city of Topeka uses, correct? I am. Okay. I just wanted to make sure on that. Do you currently reside in Shawnee County? Residency, meet the residency. <clears throat> he meets the residency requirement, Councilwoman I'm asking, I'm asking him, city manager, with all due respect. I, I would give the same answer that I meet the requirement. So that is a yes? That, I'm, that I meet the requirement. It's a yes or no. <laughs> Come on, guys. Are you, a registered, are you a registered voter in Shawnee County? Um, I think that I, I, I would refer to legal with regards to the, 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 the legal bearing of that question. Um, and I think that the staff has answered the fact that he does meet the requirement. Um, I just, I'm just cautious with the line of the questioning well, so that it doesn't put right. the city in, in a legal position of... Then I would challenge the rule of the chair if that's, if that's what you're saying. Because I, I believe that this is germane to the topic and I believe that I've had questions about this particular issue and so it's relevant to everything that we're talking about, so I would like to know where legal finds that it's not relevant. Mayor and council members, I think the topic that we're talking about today is zoo governance and this license agreement. I don't know that direct questions about residency have to do with the license agreement, and I think perhaps uh, that's a discussion for a different time. I, I would, who can I challenge beyond that? because I think that this is something that needs to be addressed, especially, and, and no, no offense towards anyone, with all due respect, because if it does not end up passing uh, and it stays within the, uh, the realm of the city the way it is, I think that we should know. And I would also go as far as to say the information that I received from the city manager that had a ton of legalese involved in it and grateful for all of the documents that were sent forth when I asked what directors 
were uh, living either within or outside of Shawnee County, I was given forms that look like they are complied with, but there's no way of knowing on an annual or every two years or every three years if a director is still living in, uh, in Shawnee County. So that's why I'm asking and going further than the information that I received. And I don't think, that, and one of, the, one of the items that's asked for when you verify with someone uh, if they're a resident or not is you ask for voter registration. It's, it's in the paperwork that I was provided. City Manager. Correct. It is one of the items that is allowed to be presented, but it mm -hmm. is not the only one that, right. a, that a director or any city employee, for that matter, would have to produce. There are other options besides that. And what I would invite would be, it, I've, seen, I've seen the email, and mm -hmm. um, I think that if this is a specific subject that you would like for us to address, mm -hmm. we can absolutely have a discussion on the subject. However, the, the request would be that, if possible, if we could stick to the evening um, discussion of the governance of the zoo, and we can absolutely bring up in the agenda the questions, any questions that you may have later on about the residency, and we could talk about adding it for discussion. Is that adequate? I'm fine. Is that, is that okay? Well, I don't, because I'm new and I don't know if this is something that goes for a vote, I'm really not okay with it because, again, I do feel it's germane and I don't feel that the answers are being straightforward but if that's what you say where it needs to go after that and with the mountain of information that we are being given on this licensure everything is gone over in this licensure but to have that considered as you know not germane it just it, it does not make sense to me but if that's the way that it needs to go then that's the way it can go and i'm happy to ensure that we have mm -hmm. the discussion item in the future agenda very okay. near. Right. Okay. You may proceed with your questions with regards I'm, to that. I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Councilwoman Thank you, Hill. Well, okay, I'll, I'll jump right in. <laughs> you know, if there was an elephant in the room, I guess it's good that you brought it up and mm -hmm. we can, can work through that. Did you say elephant? Uh, oops. <laughs> Giraffe? What do I say? Okay. Um, where I was going to go with this is that um, I was just flipping back through the paperwork. It looks like we've had, we've discussed this twice in council meetings, and I think I've been at two, maybe back in the summer, and then recently um, one-on-ones or small group discussions to kind of brief me. And so in that order, I thought I understood why we were doing this and was, and asked my questions based on what I thought when I read the licensure draft today, finally, <laughs> um, I thought maybe I've misunderstood what the idea was all along. So I wanted to just clarify. If I have two questions, Mayor. And the, the first is, what are we trying to do here? Are we wanting to hire a management company to run the city's zoo? Or was the idea that we would provide startup and reversion rights for a new company to run their own zoo. Does that make sense? Because my, my comments have been along the lines of I thought that what you wanted was to be able to have separation, pretty much full separation, so you were free to grow the zoo, raise money without being encumbered by the fact that you were part of the city, and so on. And my comments have been accordingly, but when I reread the cover sheets that we've been given and I looked at the licensure agreement, I thought, oh, maybe, maybe this is really the idea was just to have a vendor like you would hire somebody to run the expo center or, and so on, and we were supposed to own everything and just hiring somebody to, to run it for us. And so I wanted to ask for clarification. And if the vision has changed, that's okay too. Just where are we now in terms of your vision, asking Brenda, whoever, what we're trying to do here? Well, I don't know that the vision has changed per se. Okay. Um, maybe the way we have started 
talking about it since a license agreement has come into play may have changed. I think from the beginning we visioned a public-private partnership where uh, the city would continue to own the asset and based somewhat on the fact that our particular situation, there's a deed that imposes some restrictions, uh, the city would, to use your words, hire a vendor to operate its asset. Uh, I would maybe substitute that with hire an organization, use a mission-based organization to truly propel the work of the Topeka Zoo. Okay. Um. And Doug, if you'd like to disagree with what I just said, feel free. Brendan, I don't disagree. Uh, we're on the same page with that. I, I mean, I think, I think you're correct in that that's been the vision, but in terms of the conversations that we've been having with the body, there have been other alternatives raised, and so we want to be sensitive to those and make sure we explore them appropriately. Okay, well, I think I'm one of the people that made some of those recommendations, and I thought, because I thought that you needed separation, because I thought you wanted option two of what I just listed, that it would be your zoo rather than our zoo, and that you needed to be free to grow programs and raise money and, and all that. The grow programs raise money, absolutely. When that question of ownership comes up, you know, there's me who's biased by other models I'm, I'm aware of. I need to make sure I get that out there in the forefront. Um, but it's been interesting as we've had these public conversations, and some of them occur with groups of stakeholders at the zoo, that what is very important to people in this community, I believe, is that it remains their zoo that they have ownership in their zoo. And what I have heard that means coming back to me is sometimes two things. Uh, one is that the city still owns it. Not to criticize anything that an attorney can do with a contract, but it's the perception that if the city still owns it, it's their zoo. And if there are elected officials on the board, they have a say in their zoo which is interesting, to say the least. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to have to process that, because um, I looked, I was looking through the contract, at, you know, the insurance, for instance. We're self-insured. If we still own that stuff, then we're asking you to buy insurance, but why do you even need it if it's all ours? And yet, if you're out doing whatever you want to do, and we're self-insured and something happens, it could be very expensive to us. And so, you know, as, as I read through the down in the weeds kind of pieces, you know, for me, it was, well, if you own the animals and you're totally, you're just on a lease with the zoo, then it's all yours. And it was a little clearer. And so this crossover, because um, my, my second question was, again, reading the way the licensure agreement is right now, was are we expecting a net gain from this or just repositioning what we have. Who's the we in that sentence? Um, well, collectively, I guess. One would think we all would have the same vision. So I think the vision that we're trying to, to present is one that the we is the community, and the community gets a net gain at what occurs at the zoo with that product over time, that the cost or liability to the city is fairly stable and the difference is made up by additional support secured through Friends of the Zoo. That, that, the end of that's what I thought. I just wasn't sure if we maintained as much ownership as has been discussed and, and I know it's not final but has appeared in that that we wouldn't have really changed very much. So uh, that's maybe enough for now, but. Let me take one more brief little stab. Okay. Um, I used a word earlier, mission. And as a uh, observation that I've seen and been part of before, uh, 
an organization without a plan typically stays stagnant or even flails. You put that plan in place and it's amazing what you can get accomplished. In a scenario like this, if you really have a mission that an organization of employee, employees and board members can get behind, if you can really define what your purpose is and who you are and what problems you're trying to solve and remain mission-based, it's amazing the growth that can, can occur. And I know that's anecdotal, but I think that's part of that piece of sometimes the city re retains ownership, you hire an operator, and when that operator can be a mission-based group serving mission on behalf of the community, it's, it's amazing what can happen. Well, let me clarify my position on, I've been favorable toward this, but what you just described is what I thought we wanted to do. And so to do that for you all to, as I called it, not elephants, this time fly with all that, to have you tethered by our CIP or by our insurance or by a bunch of us being on the board or too big a board or all those, I didn't want that for you, right. which is why I've been the one, a, not the only one I don't think, but who's been saying, Take it, take the animals, you know, if you're gonna do it, then let's give it to you. And then when I got back into the agreement, I just, I found myself confused and so. And Doug has recorded a number of questions mm -hmm. that, um, I mean. It's okay. The world famous Topeka Zoo lives here, so I think I can make this claim. <laughs> it's not gonna be a bad thing if we create an agreement better than any other zoo has done. And so we'll sort through these questions and these observations, and the next draft will look different. And we don't have to do what another zoo has done. It was a good place, good f framework to start with, but it doesn't say that we can't be better. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Councilman Lesser to be followed by Councilman Dobler. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I won't address Kara specifically, but I'll answer some of the questions. I can clarify a few of those. Um, the city does not self-insure, um, um, and very few entities actually do self-insure. We have a stop loss or, or uh, uh, what's called basically a high retention, but, but we do not actually self-insure. So, so um, the, fa the fact is generally entities such as, as cities and stuff carry a a high stop loss on on their work comp, a high high deductible on their their, their property, auto, whatever whatever it would be. So um, it's not quite, um, but those are some points too that Doug, uh, when I met with him, there are, there are some things we do have to work out in regards to that because it does change the the uh, the amount that. If, if, if they went out on their own versus the city and we did have that catastrophic loss that, that um, um, they wouldn't have the resources to, to, to which, which is not uncommon in certain businesses. I mean, that's why, for instance, uh, State Farm has an auto company, State Farm has a property company. A lot of people don't realize State Farm property went broke and State Farm Auto had to loan them the money after the two hurricanes within it. So, that's not an uncommon um, practice, but um, I think there are, it, it was very good discussion that we had in regards to, um, I don't see, I think we have a good start on, on, on the contract or on the agreement, but, but I think it needs to be, we, there are things that you brought up that we do, that we do need to consider as we move forward on that from a cost perspective. Fair enough? Fair enough. Councilman Dobler. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll reiterate what we talked about yesterday a little bit. Uh, the zoo is a quarter, maybe a little bit more of Gage Park. And while I understand there's a master plan for the zoo, there is not a master plan for Gage Park. I'm going to have a tough time voting for this if I don't understand how the zoo fits into the overall long-term master plan for Gage Park. Again, I don't think it needs to be a, <clears throat> a large document. I don't think it needs to take a lot of time. It's just 
how does this all play out for future generations? Uh, and I think that's really important. The other thing that I guess the question is the initial term for this is 15 years, correct? 15 correct. years. Correct. That, that's our recommendation, yes. Okay. I, I mean, this is new territory. We don't know how this is going to work. <coughs> I would support something less than that, maybe a five-year initial term with the ability to tweak at that point before we go forward with what may be a 15- or 20-year uh, lease. Because we're shooting in the dark right now. We don't know how this is all going to play out. Uh, you know, if we try it, great. Let's see how it works. But I guess to the question of whose zoo is it, as long as the city of Topeka is pumping two million bucks a year into it, it's our zoo, and we need we need to be able to go back and take a look at it. So, thank you. So, yep, Councilwoman Nigger. Kind of, thank you, Madam Mayor. Kind of building off of what um, Mr. Dobler was talking about, as far as um, working with Gage Park as a whole, I think that is a very good thing looking forward. Um, I know that that brings in more working with the county. Is that something that we have done a lot of discussion in restructuring the zoo, or has this been mainly within the municipal arena? Uh, Councilwoman Nager, I would, um, I'll let Brendan add color to this, but certainly I think there's been some conversations, primarily internally, but certainly some external conversations. Uh, like you to build on what Councilman Dobler said um, as recently as maybe two years ago <coughs> the zoo was trying to move or excuse me uh, Johnny County Parks and Rec were trying to move forward with the Gage Park Master Plan we were prepared to contribute funding towards the <coughs> plan and unfortunately it was not able to come to fruition and so uh, we didn't feel like we could put our plans on hold in terms of some of the zoo projects that were going and, and even the longer term vision, but uh, certainly can appreciate how we might need to uh, <clears throat> mesh those two together a little better. But we certainly were trying to in the past and would certainly do that in the future. City Manager. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Neger, uh, in a meeting that I had with Councilman Dobler the other day, he brought up this concern regarding the Gage Park Master Plan, and I reached out today to Tim Laurent the director to see when they would be willing to look at that and uh, they're currently with the family park master plan that they're working on um, it might be a few months before they could engage with that but I've at least begun the conversations again trying to see uh, if we can fix that issue and be able to tell us what we're looking at for our gauge master park plan and if I might add two things to that mm -hmm. uh, the current master plan that we have today really is a renovation slash rehabilitation plan for the zoo. Uh, it kind of goes through the zoo and addresses old infrastructure for the most part. Uh, the K. McFarland Japanese Garden was a hiccup off that direction, but Camp Calabunga did that. The next project will, will take care of or replace old stuff. Uh, I've known since the day I've been here that it is somebody that works at the zoo after me that will address any future expansion. Uh, there's just that much work to do within our fence. Uh, to the comment, um, or qu probably question, um, there's a lot of different organizations that work in Gage Park, mm -hmm. uh, from the Civic Theater to the Discovery Center to the county to the zoo. Um, then you've got the associations that use the park Everybody that works in the park gets along really well and works really well together. And sometimes I think that's overlooked, but just simply needed to share that. Uh, there's a lot of cooperation that goes on in that park. So I would agree. Master plan needs to be done. Yeah, you were just talking about the importance to have that mission statement for the zoo, and I think that's very important, especially when you have so many organizations using that facility that, yeah, you guys are all working really well together, and I hate to be a great storm cloud, but for now. And so it would be good to know that we have that 
um, going forward. And thank you for mentioning all of the other organizations who do use that facility, that property, so we can be more cognizant of that. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. We now move on to the next item. Oh, yes, Councilwoman Heller. Could I just ask to refresh, maybe if it's changed after the conversation, what's our timeline here on? Councilwoman Hiller, we, we went into this process thinking that an ideal time frame would be in conjunction or prior to the 2021 operating budget for obvious reasons. Um, but again, given some of the conversations we heard over the last week and tonight, you know, that, that may not be doable at this point. It, it really kind of hinges on uh, what we can put together in terms of the Gage Park conversation, I would think. Because okay. everything else is flowing that direction, again, assuming that we want to continue to work that way. Okay. I've, I've not been privy to the variety of conversations, so I didn't know if the conversations that you had in the last week or this evening made a difference. So that, that's, that's good. It would be good to move it forward. Thank you. I don't see it. The clerk will read. C is discussion of the proposed 2021 to 2030 capital improvement plan and 2021 to 2023 capital improvement budget. City manager. Thank you, Mayor. As we continue to move forward with consideration of our capital improvement uh, budget, um, I've asked Jessica Lamondola to give you an update on some items, and then we have a guest speaker tonight. A well-known guest speaker. All right, so as um, the city manager mentioned tonight, I'll just give a brief overview of what you should have you should have in your possession in terms of reviewing the capital budget. And then we'll um, have Jeff White, our financial advisor, um, provide a brief overview of debt and then other debt-like instruments. Um, so on February 13th, we provided the project summaries um, for the individual projects along with the supplement number one. On the 18th, we provided supplement number two, um, which you should have had in your possession prior to last week's or the, the last council meeting. Um, last week on the 26th, we provided the, um, the entire book, which includes the CIP overview, map, project summary list, the six to 10 year project list, debt service discussion, and other, the other funds forecast. We also provided an Excel file with the project summary um, as requested. And then we also provided on the 27th the um, supplement number three. So with that, um, we are working on um, a response to a debt question regarding zoo and fire. And we hope to have that by the end of the week in terms of debt outstanding. Um, you know, I th after tonight, the next scheduled discussion will be on March 17th. Um, and that discussion will reflect any questions, concerns that um, we receive. That's really one of the, the debt discussion on or question on zoo and fire is really one of the only outstanding items that I'm aware of. Um, so if you are waiting on other items, please let me know. Um, you know, we'll work as fast as we can. Um, another request is that if you are contemplating changing amending timing funding amount funding source um, if you could just if you would give us the courtesy of a heads up so that we can help you prepare um, what that looks like for the overall um, budget and the impact in other areas if we could get that information prior to um, I think I believe April 7th is currently what we're contemplating and requesting a, a vote um, but if we can get that before that time, you know, we can obviously help you be more prepared and then also it's self-interest, right? We can also be more prepared at the same time. Um, so I think, you know, with that, you also obviously recognize that um, Nick um, is no longer with the city. So if you have questions, concerns, don't send it to his email because we probably won't get it. Um, so you can get you can contact me directly or use the budget at topeka.org email address and that goes to um, our entire team so you'll you'll get an answer probably more quickly that way as well um, you know that's that's the end of the, the, the items that I have so 
March 17th, discussion will reflect questions, concerns that we receive. April 7th, um, we'd be looking at a potential request for the budget to be approved or um, other options. So at this time, unless there's additional questions, concerns outstanding, um, I'll ask Jeff uh, White from Columbia Capital to come up and give his brief um, overview of debt and other debt-like instruments. Okay. Jeff? Madam Mayor, members of the Council, good evening. Jeff White with Columbia Capital Management. It's our honor to serve as the city's financial advisor. Uh, so you're in the midst of uh, capital planning, and uh, in most cases, cities have kind of two ways to finance the capital plan. Uh, you either have cash to pay for it or you use debt to borrow it. So I want to talk generically about uh, why cities use debt, uh, how cities can use debt in Kansas, a, a very tiny scratch the surface bit of information about those structures, uh, and a little bit about how the city uses those. And then if you have a burning desire to, uh, to uh, see my super handsome face again in the future, <laughs> Uh, certainly happy to come back and uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, <laughs> uh, certainly happy to come back and uh, do a deep dive both on the city's geo borrowing program. We can talk about structure and philosophy and rating and all those things, as well as uh, the, the city's combined utility debt. So, why do cities borrow? Uh, so, commonly, cities borrow. Um, uh, kind of big picture philosophically, uh, to spread out capital expenditures. So the city, uh, as you all know, you've, you've kind of bound yourselves to this idea of only uh, approving $9 million in new general obligation borrowing each year. But those of you who have been on the council for a while know that the actual borrowing uh, pattern or the actual expenditure pattern of those capital expenses tends to be a little bit lumpier than that. You heard the city engineer earlier tonight Talk about some projects being done as quickly as the summer and other projects taking two years. And so using debt allows you to kind of smooth out those ex expenditures over time. It also, as a corollary to that, allows you to smooth out levy demands. So you could fund your capital program by saying, hey, taxpayers, this year we're not doing any projects that require property taxes. Next year we need eight mills. And the following year we need four mills. That tends to make people a little bit upset. And so if instead of that, you say, hey, look, we're going to use borrowing, and as a general practice, we're going to say we have an existing debt service levy, and we're going to try our very hardest to fit our borrowing in under that debt service levy in such a way that it basically does not change. And that's really been the practice uh, of the city uh, for uh, going back to the days when I worked uh, for the city and, and potentially even before. Same thing on the, uh, on the revenue bond side. So. Uh, our revenue debt is supported by water, sewer, and stormwater charges. It's not tax supported. And the same thing there. Folks that get a water bill would like to know that that water bill outside of their usage is going to be relatively consistent from month to month. And so we use debt to kind of moderate those, those rate increases as well. And then the last thing on here is, uh, is intergenerational equity. And this is the idea that if you're building a water treatment facility um, that's going to provide water for the next 40 years, that users of that facility throughout the 40 years should be paying their fair share of the capital costs of having that utility as well. So debt is a way to make sure that the current generation is not funding 100% of the capital cost for an asset that's going to last a long time. So we have some statutory constraints in Kansas. Uh, the key one is we can only borrow for capital projects here in the state. We can't do working capital financings in Kansas as a, as a city or county for that matter. We have this masterful little statute called the Kansas Cash Basis Law, which you've probably all run into at this point, or if you haven't, you will during the budget process. Generally speaking, you can only spend the money you have in your treasury, and you can't appropriate funds beyond the current fiscal year. So when the council looks at contracts and those kinds of things, and we'll talk about this as we go along, if the contract obligation is multi-year, the commitment to fund beyond the current year is subject to an, an annual appropriation for next year's budget. The other thing uh, to know about borrowing for cities in Kansas is there's only really three paths that we have. We have bonds, we have notes, and we have special kinds of loans. So cities can't go out and just get a bank loan. It's, it's, it's not permitted. Uh, you can do a bank loan kind of looking thing, but you've got to wrap it into a, into a bond structure to do that. So what's a bond? Well, a bond is really a long-term loan. 
Uh, in Kansas, depending on the kind of bond, the longest term that we can go is up to 40 years. Uh, and the repayment of that debt or loan is uh, formally secured on the general obligation side by the city's full faith and credit promise to pay. What that means is when you issue general obligation debt, you promise those bondholders that you will use any sources of revenue lawfully, lawfully available to the city, including raising property taxes as high as they have to go and as long as they need to in order to repay that debt in full and on time. General obligation debt is really considered the gold standard in our industry because you have the taxing base of the public behind the repayment. In the case of our revenue debt, we have a pledged revenue stream. We tell the bondholders we're going to collect water, sewer, and stormwater revenues. We're going to pay the operating costs of those, of those utilities. And then everything that's left is available to you to pay debt service. So for the city of Topeka, and this is not the case necessarily for smaller communities in Kansas, but for the city of Topeka, there are constitutional uh, or statutory, I should say, constraints on the amount of debt that you can borrow. That is not a practical constraint for us. You, you would uh, be in very low credit rating territory and well beyond the comfort level of, of this governing body if we issued as much debt as we could under, under state law. So there are statutory limits to the amount of general, general obligation debt that can be issued, but they're not practical constraints here. So bonds are longer term loans. We also have this thing called notes. A note is basically a short term general obligation bond. In Topeka, we use them for one year term. Uh, and we do that because we're looking to fit that into a specific uh, market. Uh, investors that are looking to buy instruments that have maturities 13 months and less in order to get the best borrowing rates there. So why use notes instead of just doing all bonds? So generally speaking, in a what, what the economists call normal yield curve, where uh, short, the, the shorter you borrow, the lower the interest rate is, the longer you borrow, the higher interest rate is. If we're borrowing at the very short end of the interest rate curve, we're paying the lowest possible cost. So, so a piece of this use of notes is to take advantage of, of the short end of the curve. It's also a more efficient way for us to fund those multi-year projects. We do a project that spans a couple fiscal years. We borrow notes this year, and then next year we come back when that project's nearly done. We take out the old notes, we issue bonds, we finance that project for a multiple period of multiple years. We know exactly what we're borrowing. That leads into the next point, because we know exactly what we're borrowing. It reduces our care and feeding for this tax uh, federal tax consequence called arbitrage rebate liability. I, I'll go there if you, if you make me, but I'm going to just, just trust me on that one. Uh, and then for certain Kansas programs, we're required to do temporary financing before permanent financing. So in the past, the city has issued bonds to support benefit districts or special assessment projects, same thing. Uh, and that statute requires us to use temporary financing until the project is done and has been finally certified, and then we can convert those to long-term bonds. The third category, bonds, notes, and special loans, there's a couple kinds of loan programs that the state offers. The city has used uh, these loan programs in the past. They have become unattractive for a variety of reasons for us, and we haven't used them recently. Uh, but these are specific loan programs created by the legislature to be available to, to local governments. <coughs> and they are also permitted exceptions to Kansas cash basis. All right, so this slide, I, wanna, I need to explain what the air quotes means. So we have debt, and I've just talked about bonds, notes, and loans, debt, under a statutory construct, uh, construct or a constitutional construct, and then we have debt. The city has the ability to do a borrowing that feels like debt. You're borrowing money for a long term, maybe 10 years or something, to finance a fire truck, let's say. But we do that through a structure that is actually a series of one-year contractual obligations to pay that off. So a lease purchase financing is, is maybe a concept that you might be familiar with for debt in air quotes. This is not debt for statutory purposes, right? It's not a bond, uh, it's not a note, and it's not a specified uh, loan permitted under state law. So we can do that borrowing using the city's general contracting power, but again, we've gotta make that match up with Kansas cash basis law, and I told you a few slides ago, Kansas cash basis says you can only commit funds during the current fiscal year. You can't do it beyond. And so what we're doing is we're basically going to a lease financing company and saying, trust us, we promise, 
next year in the budget, we'll put enough money in our request to the council before they approve the budget for the year in order to make the payment on that piece of equipment. Believe it or not, that structure works just fine. There is a level of trust between cities and financing companies uh, that the financing companies believe they will get paid. They believe that you will think it's like debt and you will treat it like debt in terms of making sure that it gets paid. Uh, but it's important to remember that under state law, it's different from a general obligation bond, right? You, you don't have the authority to commit to that for the entire term. You're committing in a series of one-year uh, contracts. So I will tell you, uh, and we have fortunately few, but uh, prominent examples where this has occurred. In other states, it's terribly difficult to issue general obligation bonds. Missouri is a great example. If you want to issue geo debt in Missouri, uh, depending on the election you go to, it requires either a 57% or a 66 and th two thirds percent approval. Uh, if you think about your own family, if you can get two thirds of your family to agree on anything, it's kind of a miracle. And for a geo debt offering, depending on the election you go to, you're asking the voters to agree, two thirds of the voters to agree to geo. And so in Missouri, because that threshold is so high, you see a lot of this debt in air quotes where they're doing these kinds of lease structures. There are some uh, communities that have decided that five years, 10 years, 15 years into a project that they really didn't like uh, what the governing body decided five, 10 or 15 years ago and they're going to not appropriate those dollars uh, in their next year's budget to continue to pay for the asset that was financed. That's called a non-appropriation event. It is not a default, right? Again, I, I mentioned we have this, this statutory constraint that says you can't bind future governing bodies to commit funds. They've got to do that for themselves. The rating agencies, however, don't care whether it's a default or not. They will uh, instantaneously downgrade your credit ratings into junk status. Uh, because you've refused to pay on that. That's a pretty significant enforcement mechanism, really the lack of access that a community that suffers a non-appropriation event or causes a non-appropriation event uh, keeps folks paying these, these obligations going forward. So cities using their contracting powers can, can enter into two kinds of leases. There's an operating lease, which is a right to use. Uh, my classic example of, a, of an operating lease that many organizations use well, back in the day, they probably don't anymore, is a copier lease, right? Photocopiers, when those were things. Um, you know, that asset, you lease it for five years, you make an, a monthly payment or an annual payment. By the, by the time that thing runs its lease term, uh, you've got to pay somebody to haul it off. It has like zero value left. You've used the whole thing. You're not buying the asset. You're buying the right to use the asset for that period of time. Let's distinguish that from a capital lease or a lease purchase. My fire truck example before. You want to purchase a fire truck, it's a million dollars. Uh, you do a five year lease, you pay $200,000 a year. At the end of that five year term, uh, you purchase that fire truck for the remaining uh, fair market value, you own the truck. So that's a financing lease rather than, a, than an operating lease. So some leasing best practices that our, that our clients look at uh, using competition to drive down costs. So uh, this idea of allowing the vendor to be your, your financing company uh, has less and less traction these days. Most folks will separate the purchase of the asset from the financing of the asset. So um, Brent's fire truck company may sell you the fire truck, and Tony's finance company may provide the, the, the financing for that. Uh, it's important for uh, financing leases uh, to, to separate and understand what the embedded costs of borrowing are. So there's a borrowing cost in there, there's a profit margin for the, for the lease co in there. Uh, and it can be difficult sometimes to tease that information out. And then you can also use structures called master leases, which the city does, where you enter into an overall agreement with a finance company and you basically give yourself the right to say, uh, hey, we don't necessarily need to borrow for a fire truck today, but we may three months from now. You negotiate all the documents and then when the fire department says we need the fire truck, Basically, all it is is you create a schedule that says, I need to borrow a million dollars over five years. Here's the payment term. Sign on the dotted line. And all of the negotiation of the documents has already been done. All right. So common questions that I get as I talk to folks like you uh, around the state, uh, around the nation. Uh, first one, how much debt is too much? This is really a policy question. 
uh, and it comes down to uh, a couple factors. So if you were a smaller city in Kansas, uh, I can tell you that the statutory debt limit can be a real constraint. Um, again, that's not really an issue here, but we can rely on what third parties, such as rating agencies, tell us uh, is a reasonable amount of debt to have based upon what other communities like us have. Uh, but ultimately, it's your decision to establish the property tax levy, or at least the property tax demand, uh, and use your rates and charges for your revenue bonds uh, in order to determine how much debt the, the city can have. Are the city's bond ratings any good? Yes. So the city's general obligation bond rating is the third highest available, a double A rating. So it's double A, double A plus, I'm sorry, triple A, double A plus, and then double A were the third highest GO. Uh, the city's revenue bond rating is one notch below that, different company, so slightly different uh, uh, nomenclature there, but the fourth highest rating available. The city's general obligation bond rating uh, over the past 15 years has gone from fairly weak to very strong. We are probably closer at this point to a double A plus than we are to a double uh, A minus. Uh, so general obligation bond rating, the city's done everything that rating agencies, I'm sorry? What's that? Yeah, yeah. We, city, the, the, um, uh, the city's done everything that uh, rating agencies have asked of it over the last 15 years, growing fund balance, moderating debt burden, uh, and then we've also benefited from some growth in the community, growth in the tax base, and those kinds of things. The city's credit rating on its utility debt, again, is strong, but that rating is under pressure. So uh, that one is more likely to go down than up, and that is predominantly because of the significant amount of capital investment that, that the utilities need here in Topeka. So that will likely be a, an ongoing conversation to have. Uh, is there a benefit to using notes refinance with bonds rather than just issuing bonds? We talked about this a little bit. Uh, what we found as we've looked at this practice in Topeka over the years is that the city has generated economic advantage by using the short end of the yield curve to do construction project and finance construction or project and process financing basically uh, and then moving to long-term bonds over the years. The other thing I should note is the Kansas revenue bond statutes don't have an analogy to a temporary note, which we talked about as a general obligation structure. Structure, The city uses geo temp notes to benefit the combined utility to, to finance uh, construction and progress, which is a nice benefit to your utility. Can debt, again, the air quotes, right? This is, so this is not bonds, notes, or loans. This is lease purchase financing, those kinds of things impact the city's credit rating. The answer to that question is yes. Uh, so again, rating agencies don't really care whether it's not technically debt. They see it as a long-term liability regardless, and they're going to treat it as such. And so whether you're issuing geo debt or lease purchase financing, uh, the rating agencies are going to look at it roughly the same way. Uh, the other thing I should note is that um, under recent changes in our bond disclosure, once we've issued the bonds going forward, we have to notify the market anytime we do debt uh, that's material to the city's financial condition. So it's not like we can hide a lease purchase from the market. Let's say if our, if our bonded debt was too high and we wanted to do a borrowing, but we didn't want it to look like debt, can't really hide that. Uh, so when should the city use leases? Operating leases, this is really kind of one of those situations where you know you're going to completely use the value of that asset and you're, you're going to need, you know, nobody needs copiers anymore. But back in the day, again, people needed copiers. And once the old one died, a new one came in because the, the copies continued to, to, uh, to, be per to be made going forward. On a finance lease, from the city's perspective, other than tax lid considerations, which I do want to talk about uh, briefly, I don't see a real distinction between a tax-exempt lease purchase and a bond. In terms of financing costs, it's going to be pretty much the same. So what I've shared with staff is uh, if you, we know we're coming up on a regular bond issue for the city and you've got equipment to finance that's in the, in the capital program, throw it in the bond. And if we're off cycle from bond, do a lease purchase, purchase financing is just fine. So let me stop very quickly at tax lid because this is a key distinction. So uh, when the legislature gifted us with a tax lid a few years back, 
And what they exempted from that tax lid was um, debt service on general obligation bonds. So if the council adopts an ordinance to issue general obligation bonds, the, the spending to pay the principal and interest on that bonds is exempt from the tax lid. If you do a lease purchase, you are paying for that payment out of your operating budget, and that does impact the tax lid. So all things being equal, borrowing costs might be the same lease purchase versus bonds on a piece of equipment, but it does have, the lease purchase has a negative impact on your capacity under the debt lid. I've got a slide in here I'm not going to go over. Yet. Certainly happy to answer any questions if you're interested. Based upon operating lease versus purchase and finance, this is an actual example from another city. This is not from Topeka involving Ford F-150 pickup trucks. They just went through this exercise. I found it kind of interesting. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, certainly happy to come back uh, if, if you'd like me to, to take a deeper dive into the city's actual debt structure, both geo and utility revs. Madam Mayor, happy to try and answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. White? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Jeff, first of all, thank you for this presentation. This, uh, this really clears up a lot of things uh, and, and gives us a lot of great information. Um, I did have some question. Uh, you know, you mentioned your know, long-term structure, uh, you know, interest rates, usually the yield curve slopes up usually. Yeah. Doesn't always. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but when we do all those short-term issuances, there's a cost of issuance. Yep. And is even, even including that, is it still cheaper? It is. Yeah, that, that's what we found over the years is it, it, it ends up being um, more efficient to save the interest cost over that, over that borrowing period and pay the additional cost. The, the temp note issuance costs tend to be very, very modest, particularly compared to the size of the temp notes the city's done in the past. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so at what point, you know, right now, we just obviously have this with the coronavirus thing. Yeah. The Fed took some action yesterday. Yep. Is there ever a time when we want to lock in these low rates? You know, they're not going to stay forever. So I will tell you that, you know, when the Fed acts, it's really acting at the very, very shortest end of the curve, kind of overnight money sure. out count. to maybe six months it affects. But at the same time, I joke all the time, it's not really a joke, What's bad for the world is good for our market. So if you are an issuer, things like this coronavirus scare right. uh, pushes interest rates lower. So I was, I was just showing Jessica in the audience earlier, if you look at the borrowing cost for a AAA borrower between one year and 30 years in the market today, the highest interest rate on that 30-year curve is a 152. So if you're, a, if you're a AAA entity, state of Missouri, AAA borrower, uh, and you issue debt, they did recently, they issued debt, they were in the market last week, they had no interest rates over 1% on their, on their refunding transaction. So if, is there a great time to lock in interest rates? It's historically speaking, literally every day this month, well, we're in March, but going even back to February, we've seen uh, historic record lows on yields hit literally every day. Uh, so now is definitely a great time to think about locking in those rates long term. And refinancing stuff. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and we're constantly, by the way, looking at that for the city. Uh, the, we've historically used, so when um, debt's issued in the municipal market, the standard right to call that out of the market for refinancing uh, is 10 years without penalty in the municipal market. It's not like a mortgage where tomorrow you can refinance okay. your mortgage if you want. There's a 10-year lockout usually. City has historically used five- and six-year calls, which means that we have the ability as interest rates have fallen from 2009 to the present, basically, uh, to be in the market twice as often to pick up those refunding savings as other communities, and we've done that um, um, very, very in a very disciplined way uh, along the way. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing no other questions, we do have somebody signed up for public comment. Thank you. We have Ms. Helen Simmons. Ms. Helen Simmons or Simons? Oh. 
Hi, I'm Helen Simmons, uh, mayor, council members, and city manager. Uh, I do not know if my timing is right on this subject, uh, but anyhow, here it is. It concerns part of our city manager's uh, plans for our city, which I understand will be presented tonight for consideration. Here is my opinion on part of it, and maybe uh, it will be shared by others. Uh, I am here regarding the city manager's plan for the total relocation of the Quincy Street Viaduct on downtown I-70. The present alignment is designed to be traveled safely if caution is observed. It has served us adequately over many, many years. The fact that over this time span, five or six, maybe seven drivers have had an incident there has come out to some as a major problem. <coughs> Do they not pay attention, ignore highway safety signs, and I guess are not concerned about the flashing orange lights? <coughs> and uh, maybe they just lose track of how fast they are going. The city manager's plan is to borrow 20 million plus interest and destroy the present setup. This is part of his master plan. As opposed, to, as opposed to this, could not first another solution be considered as another option? Uh, is it possible to alert and instill more caution to these wayward drivers, enlarge the orange flashing lights, and also install them on the side of the road as well. Perhaps more and larger warning signs could also be installed. 20 million plus interest will put the city in heavy debt with no regard to the added tax burden. As with most projects, it will most likely go over budget as a guardian, and I repeat guardian, of our tax dollars, I hope the council members will look closely at this and other future plans regarding our city budget. Uh, as this, and with this, as other city projects, I hope this is not already a done deal. I could say more, but I hope this will be sufficient. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Additional discussions from the body with regard to this item? Councilwoman Hillen. Well, Mayor, I, I, I take your advice. I came prepared to talk about some, some general thoughts that I had. <coughs> if this is appropriate or we wanted to move on. <coughs> oh, thank you. Well, um, I appreciate that as of today, we have now, all of us, I think, have all the materials that we need. I think we're at different points of getting through it, but and I also appreciate the responses we've had to the questions over the last six weeks as we've started on this. I've got some overall comments to make today and likely we'll have a few more after I've had time to study them further and maybe float them with a, a few folks. Um, I've said before that um, uh, my idea is that we should continue to borrow as little as possible. Um, despite the rates, um, we have part of what has improved our, our bond rating and our financial position is the reduction in the amount of debt and that was the intent of earlier councils. Also, I would note that we are hoping, and for Mrs. Simmons, if she's still here, um, hoping to get mostly grant money to cover the Polk Quincy Viaduct, but we also um, have created an outtown TIF and are looking at, at prospects that, that could be some major projects that we've not yet contemplated. And so to me, we should look at everything, we should pinch every penny on, on the projects that are in this proposed capital plan, not because we don't want to do them, but to figure out how to be the most cost effective 
in managing the tax dollars that we have. One thought that I'd like to put forth um, this evening, I've got a couple general ones to float at this point. Um, the staff is proposing that we provide a million a year sort of a block fund for fleet purchases. The more I thought about that, the more it concerns me. I would like to see us revert the proposed million a year back into the operating budget. Um, I don't believe that most of these purchases would meet our debt policy test of being major purchases and long-term <coughs> investments. Um, the costs of bonding would likely not be cost effective with five or 10 year payback periods because there are costs of, of, of purchasing the bonds. I am willing to consider leasing. Um, if it could pencil out, I'd prefer that we look at going back to what we used to do uh, for years, which was to bu budget snow removal every year. And on the years where we had a bad winter, we spent it all. So be it on the years that were good years, we used it to buy equipment. And if, if there were a way that that could pencil out, that might be a way to manage the making sure. That means we have to work hard enough on the budget to make sure we don't get caught short like we did this year so that whatever was budgeted for that department or for snow removal, for instance, is still going to be there at the end of the year. That can't be our cushion if we need to buy our equipment that way. But it, um, it has worked in the past. On facilities, um, the staff proposed starting last year that we budget a kind of a con conglomerate of started at, I think it's about 1.6 something million a year, and it goes to 2.3 million a year just by the end of the five-year proposed plan. Someone from this body asked the staff to give us a list of exactly what was in that facilities plan, and we <coughs> got that a week or so ago, maybe. Um, if you look at that list, they, um, the projects range in, in cost from about $1,200 most of them are under $80,000, and they range from like $1,200 to $80,000. Um, with that, then, we got ourselves in some of the trouble that we've just been digging out of because the city, city fathers and mothers in the past pooled projects in order to hit what was then a $100,000 threshold. Now it's one hundred and twenty-five. dollars um, The way that budget is set uh, is proposed right now. There's not only the, the 1.6 to 2.3 million borrowing, but there's also 300,000 a year in cash. So some of those small ones may have been intended to be out of that cash budget anyway. Um, I would note, however, with the pooling idea that the fire stations are in there, and I don't think anybody doubts that they need to be done, but fire station number three came in about a million dollars over budget. And had it, it was in the last year of, of being itemized. Had it been in this pool, it would never have come back to us, and we would not have been involved in the consideration of that and might not have even known. That's a million dollars. I, I think it was that much. Um, by pooling, we are not approving projects. Um, my thought when I went back through that is that, and I know that there's a mix of general fund enterprise fund and zoo projects in that list too so they would they would sort out a little bit um, I, and I appreciate the staff's feeling for flex but I think we need to go back to individual projects um, the ones that are over $125,000 and actually budget them as we used to do by the year that it seems that they would roll up um, and I would think that would only the way that list looks, it would only be the major remodels. I could see including things like roofs, which are 30 to 50 year investments at this point, but not, not the smaller repairs. I will have some questions about some of those as well. I'm not sure why it would cost $3,500 to, to put in smoke detectors in almost any building, or maybe the issues of emergency lights, for instance, which are about $4,000 a building. Um, I don't know if they're required or not, but I'll, I'll put those specific questions together. I think that would net out to about 700000 to a million dollars a year in capital projects versus the, the 2.3 that's proposed at this point. 
on the fire fleet. Jeff kept looking at me. He knows I want to revert the fire engines back to cash. <laughs> um, if there's a way for us to use the operating budget and the debt service cash and year-end cash to purchase trucks the next three years, um, I note that, um, therefore, we would protect the addition of additional debt service. Each time we would not borrow, we wouldn't have the debt service coming up. Um, I note from our discussions last year that both Heartland Park and College Hill debt service will end. We've been paying that ourselves out of the debt service fund. We'll end in either 2024 or 2025 if there was a way we could pencil out that conversion of the fire trucks starting this year or next. So there's always a, a transition period, but once you get done with that, you're ahead. And, and we did have a period where we were so far behind for those who are new that we leased the fire trucks just to get the fleet started again. So we really haven't borrowed that borrowed for that many yet, I don't think. I don't think our debt service level is up very high. Um, I think a combination just of those proposals could bring that proposed budget at or under our debt service limit that's in our policy right now. The project budget as proposed was over. So I just wanted to throw those, what is that, three prospects out this evening um, for consideration. And I understand they might not pencil, but they might. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments or questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. We now move on to the public comment. We do have somebody signed up to speak. Ms. Charlene Sexton. Good evening. I think you, how many of you have heard the phrase enough is enough? I think most of us have. And that is what brings me here this evening. My mother and I have had enough. We returned from out of state to the property on Southeast Kentucky Avenue to find the blighted structure that's next door. The blighted structure is 2129 Southeast Kentucky Avenue. It's just six houses away from the brand new Votec building that just opened in May. Is this a recent experience? Unfortunately, it's not. This structure is a rental property. And I want to ask you what regulations and policies are in existence for a property that is owned by an out-of-state company, an LLC, in the <coughs> state of Texas. It was bought 20 years ago. And ever since that time, this structure has gone from a fine property, a block on which I grew up, happily, securely, safely, to a block that is unfortunately, largely because of this property, that is used as a tax shelter by an LLC in the state of Texas. It's gone from bad to worse to being horrendous, and for the residents of this block, a factor of social, personal, and physical safety. Several years ago, my father, who is now deceased, walked out to find a man shot dead on the driveway at 2129 Southeast Kentucky Avenue. The residents of this block constitute non-school-age children, school-age children, working adults, retirees, and seniors like my mother. Would you be concerned if your mother lived next to this kind of property? Would you be concerned? 
Would you want to have the welfare of all the residents of this block to be protected and secured from this kind of absolute tyranny of economic and social injustice? I don't think that's asking too much, especially when uh, all the residents of this block are wonderful people, hardworking, and it's a matter of social in, and economic injustice, not for the residents, but for the people who are renting this sordid, despicable property. I'm asking for your help. I'm asking for your direction. I'm asking that this property might be considered as a restore rev revitalization project done by the uh, Habitat. So it could be a secure property for low-income folks. It's not too much. It's really not too much to ask. And we want this. My mother, I want this. I want her to be safe and secure physically, socially, personally. But I also want for the, all the residents in the neighborhood to be so secure. So. I'm uh, May, your time has expired. To, yes. Would you would you need some more time for your no. remarks? Yeah. Okay. I'm 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 very pleased to come. We were more than glad, my mother and I, to wait for this time because we've we've worked on this for years and years. And I said, Mom, tonight enough is enough. We're gonna go down to the city council meeting. This is democracy in action. That's all we're asking for. We're asking for your help. Thank you. Thank you for Thank your you comments. Thank you so much. Councilwoman Hiller. I don't know if they've been in touch with code, but can we refer her to? I was actually going to ask city manager to get in touch with her before she left and ask her not to leave. <laughs> but thank you. Um, as you heard, ma'am, if you could please stick around. We're almost done with the meeting. And we'll make sure the city manager and you touch base before you're done tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much. We now move on to the <coughs> announcement, city clerk. Uh, the March 10th agenda includes, it looks like, uh, three board appointments. Uh, action items include the demolition of the structure at 1104 Southwest Western Avenue and 1108 Southwest Western Avenue. Um, we have a Fire Service Special Committee report is a request to extend the deadline, and then the Social Service Grants Committee report. Non-action items is a discussion on governing body goals and objectives review. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. I have two items tonight. Uh, the City of Topeka 2021 Budget Engagement Session, our next one is Saturday, March 7th, from 10 to 11 at the Topeka Shawnee County Public Library in the Marvin Auditorium Room. So. If you're interested in the budget engagement session, come March 7th from 10 to 11. It's an educational session that informs them a little bit about how we do our budget. The other item I have is there will be a joint zoo and U.S. Census Bureau press conference at the zoo this Thursday where a collaboration between the city, the U.S. Census Bureau, Kansas Counts, and a tiger will be announced and information shared on an in initiative to bring more attention to the need to be counted. That's all I have. So tonight I want to first of all say thank you to our staff that worked so hard on the budget. It was a whole citywide effort to try to make sure that we contained the budget. And that allowed us to have um, not only us the, the ability to meet our budget deadline, our requirement, but also to have a little bit of a surplus. Which I'm sure one of the first things that I asked Jessica when we were talk, having the conversation about this was, are we going to be able, be able to fully fund our senior centers? with the dollars that we had promised them, and the answer is yes. So just wanted to make sure that, just said thank you to you guys, because I know that it was hard. Every single expense was being audited. So that's a lot of work. Um, the other thing that I want to say is, no uh, offense to my colleague here, but the Lady Trojans are expected to win the championship. Uh, they are 28-0. They are and 0. Um, and these girls will spend, if they win tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, um, they will go to state and they're going to be there all week. So that's pretty amazing. Um, so if tomorrow you have a chance, go and cheer on our 
Lady Trojans. <laughs> hoi, hoi. Yeah, right? Hoi, hoi. Um, I want to always err on the side of transparency and want to let everybody know that um, I received a, a report recently that the new slate of students that are part of the Top City Youth Council was released. Um, and I found out that my daughter made the cut for that group. My first question was, who else announced? And oh my god, this is horrible. Um, and I was told that nobody else um, had applied for District 5. Um, I have had a conversation with my daughter. I think that she initially thought that she was applying for the commission. Um, or maybe I thought that she was just applying for the commission. And, um, and, and I told her, hey, just want to make sure that I'm going to be really open with the public. Um, the, the application is done by the students. Um, and again, there were no other students for District 5 that applied. And, and I'm going to be really appreciative to some of the council members that reached out and said, you know, I shouldn't penalize her because of the public appearance. So I'm making sure that I am being open about it and discussing it. Um, and the youth council can speak as well to the fact that she was the only student that applied for the 5th District which is going to be extremely awkward for me when I run these meetings. Because um, she's extremely <laughs> outspoken, and it's going to be fun. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say tonight is I am extremely proud of the city of Topeka. Um, the Greater Topeka Partnership has been working for a while, ever since we brought, brought over Katrin Bridges, to make sure that we had pl uh, entrepreneurship bubbling up in our community. And this morning, I was able to participate in plug and plays welcome ceremony in which they had panels and they had individuals from all over the area um, talking about bioagro. We had Saeed, who is the CEO of Plug and Play, right here in our community at Security Benefit. Um, and we have different organizations that are looking to help us um, ensure that we have the capital to fund all the startups that we, we may potentially have. Just to make you guys have an idea, every six months we're going to have anywhere from eight to 12 startups in this community. Eight to 12 startups. And the idea is that as they are successful, Saeed was funny because he said, you know, we, we give them the additional funds, we give them all the, all the services, we support them with marketing, we support them with research, we support them with, you know, everything that somebody needs to start their business. And after that, we pray a lot <laughs> that they work. And when they do work, they could represent multi-million dollar organizations. And because they're here in this community, the likelihood of them staying here and growing our community is significant. So to the partnership, thank you. To Saeed, Hutch, and Steve, thank you for choosing Topeka yet again. Um, and to Katrin Bridges and her board of directors, um, thank you for your leadership. Our, our community is extremely proud today. And then, of course, finally, just another um, acknowledgement of Mayor Bunton. Um, I know that we gaveled them out today and just want to reiterate the fact that we are hurting with his family, um, that they are in our prayers. Uh, Councilman, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and I will also congratulate the Lady Trojans on uh, <laughs> that. I, but I also want to add that uh, Kiki Smith, the fantastic freshman they have, um, grew up in the Shawnee Hats district until just recent, until this year, where a family moved. So uh, no, I'm not, I'm not saying they're recruiting. I would never say that about 501 school. No, never mind. I, I'll shut up before I say anything else. But no, she's a fantastic girl, and I, I do wish them luck. Councilman Padilla. I neglected to uh, mention that tomorrow evening at six o'clock. Uh, City Manager is going to be on the air on a radio broadcast hosted by AARP here in Topeka. And it's with regards to the census. It's a, a, what they call a tele town hall. And he'll be there answering all kinds of questions. Uh, he's been, uh, been receiving a lot of data, so have all the details. So if you get a chance, you can log on to Facebook at facebook.com slash AARPKS. And you can see the live stream of it. So I'll be there cheering him on in the background. So I want to thank him for taking up that uh, charge and, and, and doing the broadcast. So listen in on it. I think I'll do well. Thank you. Councilwoman Nager. 
Um, I wanted to thank the staff um, for all of the work that you all have been doing for preparing us and keeping us in the loop and asking our numerous questions, answering our numerous <laughs> questions. We're asking them. Um, I also want to thank Chief Duke for taking me on a tour of the different um, firehouses in my district and talking to me for a very long time and then getting lost and then getting back on track. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, I also just wanted to make an announcement to the citizens of District 6 that I will be planning on having kind of a meet and greet at PT's Coffee on, I'll give you the date because I don't want to mess it up, March 22nd, that is the Sunday, and I'll be there starting at about 2 p.m. Um, if you would like to come on by, get to know me a little bit better, I will be there. Thank you. Oh, and that's PT Co PT's Coffee at 17th and Washburn. Councilman Dobler. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had an issue in my district uh, with a neighborhood. Um, asked some of the city staff to uh, come and visit with the neighbors. Uh, city manager, city attorney, the police chief all showed up and it was it was great. I think they they were very happy to see that much response from from staff. So appreciate that. Um, you know, I I uh, started here in 2005, sitting in Mr. Trout's seat, or actually I think it was Doug's seat, uh, the first day the mayor Button walked in, and uh, just a great guy. I learned a lot from him. He had great stories. And he really cared about this community. So, thank you. Councilman Lesser. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I too, had an incident over the weekend that uh, resulted in a phone call to uh, Chief Duke for a uh, larger constituent, property constituent in our district. And he took uh, good care of that, solved the problem, got the people out there when they couldn't get a hold of anybody else. So, I thank you for that, sir. Well, I wanted to shout out to Mike. Um, he's been doing a lot on the census and, and also helping getting the boxing program going and so on. A lot of, lot of movement uh, in the community and thank you for that. I too wanted to, to say just a brief something about Mayor Bunton. He was mayor when I was first elected and I considered him both a friend and a mentor. He, he knew so much and uh, was able to provide guidance on what was important and what to worry about and what would just kind of slide on by. And, um, I'll miss him. Uh, for those who don't know it, the services are at 11 on Thursday. So um, the public is welcome as far as I know. Thank you. Councilwoman by the um, Our condolences to, to Mayor Bunton's family uh, one of the kindest men uh, I ever knew. I considered him an elder in, in the wisdom that he had um, about conducting himself and, and his life. He was welcomed uh, at our home many times during Fiesta, and we would walk with him to the school grounds, making sure that he didn't trip on any <laughs> sidewalk that <laughs> was not in the best condition. But he always had such a good time. He never met a person that he did not like. And he has a fond, uh, fond memories uh, from my spouse and myself and uh, condolences to all. Uh, I did want to mention a couple of things. Um, I went yesterday with some NIA, Oakland NIA folks, and also with utilities people, um, a lot of people, and I was greatly impressed that uh, they all showed up to participate, to look at the continual challenges that we have with the Seward um, project and specifically with the bulb outs. Um, in this particular area of Oakland, we do have an issue with uh, water retention and not flowing uh, well enough. Uh, we're coming upon the rainy season. We also have the uh, dual issue of, with this project having been completed, uh, we have lost valuable 
valuable uh, parking spaces. Um, this particular section of Oakland is a festival community. Uh, we have the festival at Sacred Heart. We have the festival, the Fiesta at Our Lady Guadalupe. And so there is serious and deep concern about how we remedy the situation, not only with uh, the flow of water uh, and, and trying to get a better method going, uh, but also how we've lost so much parking and, and what that's going to be looking like for uh, this summer and, and for the years ahead. I'm hoping that together uh, we can come to um, something that works um, and the discussions continue. Also, I wanted to say for those folks that have been calling and emailing um, that are telling me that they, that they have no curbs and gutters and they feel that it's finally time that they have curbs and gutters and I've told them that all of this is going to take time. There is the concern that they have as we head into spring and what is anticipated to be another heavy um, rain-filled spring. I don't know how to tell these folks when I go and visit their properties and end up taking pictures how long any of this is going to take and I see the frustration um, I see the I would just say it's frustration and I just want to remind them that together if you know if you're watching tonight together we can we can work on this and, and we can make it happen because I want you to understand and to know that you deserve that quality of life that you deserve that safety and security that so many of us take for granted that have curbs and gutters and um, that I hear you. So thank you. There are no executive sessions this evening. This meeting is adjourned.